the tomb for Meris Ankh is closed. So, just waiting for them to go and get the guy with the key so I can go inside. Meres Ankh was the second wife of Pharaoh Khafra. Her majestic tomb is one of the best for a queen in all of Egypt. Her chapel has a wall with statues of ten women to accompany the queen, presumably her ladies-in-waiting, or her children, family members, and king's wives. The absolute highlight of the two is a wall featuring Meris Ankh in the middle, with all six of her children around her. Her eldest son, Neve Macht, who became Khafra's vizier. Her youngest daughter and son are shown at her feet, one holding the royal hoopoe bird. Meris Ankh is shown wearing a white and yellow dress with a cat's face on her hip and a short cropped hairstyle. She holds the queenly implements. Before her are the titles She Who Sees the God Horus and Set. Yet another strong woman is shown before Meres Ankh, an elegant and regal woman, another queen whose appearance fascinates the imagination. Many Egyptologists suggest that this is Heteperes II, the mother of Meris Ankh. However, Heteperes II is shown in the tomb already on the opposite wall. The mother and daughter are shown sailing on a boat together, Meris Ankh behind her mother. And she has long black hair, unlike the woman with the short blonde hair. Hetheperes II is always shown with long hair, even on a statue of her and Meres Ankh. In my opinion, this blonde-haired lady named Hetheperes is none other than the mother of Hufu, Hetheperes I, leading Meres Ankh her great-granddaughter, into the next life. We have Heteperes here, shown with the blonde hair. Oh, it's died. <laughs> shown with the blonde hair over here, and these strange pointed shoulder pads, almost something like out of the 80s. Opposite this, is the father of Meres Ankh and the son of Khufu that died too soon and didn't fulfill his destiny to become the next pharaoh, Kawab. He is seen holding a staff while symbolically leading in a parade of offerings into the tomb of his daughter, capturing birds of the marshes where he recounts Meris Ankh pulls papyrus for Hathor in the marshland with her mother. They see every good thing which is in the marsh. A row of men and women bearing offering baskets for her from Khafra, Jedefra, and her grandfather Khufu. A fleet of boats are seen transporting the queen. She is shown under a canopy and seated on a throne, and craftsmen are shown making spirit statues of Meres Ankh. On the queen's false door, she is seated on a lion throne. The door where her spirit could visit the tomb to receive these offerings. 
These offerings, led into the tomb by Kawab, were collated in spirit by her chief steward, Kemetnu, who is shown several times in her tomb. At the entrance, he is shown reading a papyrus before the queen, who is standing with the jackal god Anubis above. Reri, another steward on the other side, bringing in a hyena to the queen. These canine creatures were connected to the leader of the dead into the next life. Through the arch, we enter her inner sanctum, where, once a year, the sun would light up a second false door, energizing her spirit. This room leads us down into the queen's once sealed burial chamber. I'm inside the burial chamber, deep below the tomb of Medes Ank, the princess. The lights have just gone out, which is a little concerning, but I wanted to show everybody what was found in this tomb. This is Medes Ank's sarcophagus, her stone sarcophagus, which had been plundered in ancient times. This is the remains of Meris Ankh inside her sarcophagus, all pulled to pieces. This is quite sad to see because the people came in here looking for gold and they ripped her body apart to find all the gold inside. And this is the skull of Meris Ankh, the skull that was found in this very room I'm in right now, in the dark, with no electricity, <laughs> this is the princess. We're coming face to face with her in her final resting place. It's, it's quite, quite something to be face to face with Melisang. And this is a list of all the things that were found in the tomb of Melisang. And this tells us that all the gold was taken out because all that was left over was her sarcophagus, a wooden false door, and some stone statues and stone vases. But this in here tells us more about the princess than any other thing inside this tomb. The bones of this princess, what was remaining, is what tells us more than any of the decorations on her tomb. You can hear the echo. I think I'm just going to have a moment to myself. Even though Maris Unk's burial chamber is not decorated, it has these quartz crystals inside the stone so that when they left the candle burning in the tomb, as they left, all of these would have been twinkling, these little shiny stones like the night sky for Princess Meles Ankh. Texts in her tomb read, 
great favorite of Pharaoh, priestess of Hathor, mistress of Dendera, the companion of Horus, beloved of him. May she proceed in peace upon the paths on which an honored one proceeds, having gone well with her in the sight of the great God. May offerings go forth to her at the first day of the festival. Meres Ach, she who loves life, one who is noble in the sight of Anubis. When her tomb was sealed, her soul would hopefully fly up to be greeted by a set of motherly figures, whom would protect and look over the queen's final burial site. To record for eternity, the queen had scribes carved into the walls. Scribes were heavily important in ancient Egypt. They would take dictation from the king or officials, send international correspondence, assist with diplomacy, study religious texts, and compel the words of the gods, something Meres Ankh wanted to ensure. The sad thing is, Meres Ankh died middle-aged, presumably from silent sinus syndrome, evident in her skull, causing mucus to build up and breathing difficulties. She died just after her husband Khafra, before her tomb was ready, yet the successor king had her tomb completed and she was buried 275 days after her death. Among the many mysteries of the Giza Plateau, one more than any other interests me the most. Menkura was succeeded by his son Shepseskaf, ending the fourth dynasty. This is where things get muddy for Egyptologists. A controversial yet absolutely thought-provoking too, way out in the desert, near Menkura's sand-flooded valley temple, dedicated to a high-powered queen, decorated on its lower half with a false palace facade. This strange tomb consists of a two-terraced structure, similar to a step pyramid. This too was never finished, but was intended to be the fourth pharaoh's pyramid at Giza. Behind me is the tomb for Queen Kent Kawes, possibly the first ever female pharaoh. Kent Kawes, evidence points to her being the daughter of Pharaoh Menkura. She was married to her brother, Pharaoh Shepseskaf. However, when he died, his possible son, Userkaf, was too young to rule, and therefore Kent Kawes took up the role as Pharaoh, becoming the first in recorded history. The titles on the granite pillars can provide more clues. Here, her titles read Mother of two kings of Upper and Lower Egypt, while another mentions Kent Kawes as the ruler of Egypt. There is even an image of the queen sitting on a throne with what some believe is a king's nemes headdress. We get some people speculating about Kent Kawes 
Some people say no, she was no, a pharaoh, no, but there is but no we proof still of that. Really know. Yeah. But we think that she ruled as the last king of dynasty uh, for. Yeah, because she's shown with some people believe yes. is wearing an yes. image. Yes. Her tomb was entered in antiquity through a robber's tunnel and ransacked. The inside decorations of her tomb are very fragmented and only pieces of her alabaster coffin with faience inlays were discovered. However, I fear that the secrets of Kent Kawas are for another day. Nefertiti, the iconic female face of ancient Egypt, living 3,500 years ago, during an upheaval of ancient life, caused in part by her husband, Pharaoh Akhenaten. The identity of this woman has been cloaked in mystery since her rediscovery in the ruins of the city that she and her husband founded, Akhetaten, now called Armana. Nefertiti is now believed to have been a fully-fledged pharaoh, king to the throne after the uncertain death of Akhenaten. Yet, she was more than a queen, more than a ruler. Nefertiti was a mother. We know of six children born between Akhenaten and Nefertiti. It was these children that caused much controversy between Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and a secondary wife, Kia. Kia gave birth to the only male heir, now the world's most famous, Tutankhamun. Nefertiti, on the other hand, had a string of female children. But who were these daughters of Nefertiti, and why do we not hear more about them? Where are their tombs and their treasures? Why did they die young? Marry their father and brother? And what can we learn about their lives under their sheltered upbringing in the palaces of Akhetaten, closed off from the rest of the world? Did they agree with their parents' new religion? In 1912, German archaeologists were excavating at the desolate city of Armana, where they discovered many intriguing objects from Nefertiti's life, stylized yet lifelike images of the queen, pharaoh, children, and other royal family members, most notably the bust of Nefertiti. Because the times were different in the early 1900s, Many of these artifacts found at Amarna have been removed from Egypt and scattered far and wide across the world. I've come here to the Neues Museum in Berlin, where they have the biggest collection of Amarna art in the world. And I'm finally going to come face to face with the children of Nefertiti to find out who they really were. These are the daughters of Nefertiti and the sisters of Tutankhamun. Around 1352 BC, Amenhotep III was ruling Egypt. Though at quite an extended age, he probably had a co-regent a formidable woman who had assisted Amenhotep III for many decades. In fact, many foreigners preferred to converse with this queen rather than the pharaoh. It was in one of these foreign letters from a king of the Hittites that he congratulated the queen on the birth of her grandchild, Merit Aten. This grandmother and queen was none other than Queen T. Amenhotep and T had several children, including a young prince, the future pharaoh, 
Akhenaten. They lived in Thebes, on the west bank in an opulent palace called Malkata. The son of T and Amenhotep III was named Amenhotep IV. However, shortly after his father's death, he changed his name from Amenhotep IV to Akhenaten. Amenhotep IV had married a young girl from a noble family, Nefertiti. Ancient textual evidence possibly names her father as a courtier of Amenhotep III and the brother of Queen T. His name was I. Toward the end of Amenhotep III's life, Akhenaten and Nefertiti had their first child together. They named her Merit Aten. Her name means the one who makes the sun god Aten happy. By naming their daughter this, it was a foreshadowing of what religious changes were afoot. Merit Aten would have known her grandfather Amenhotep III before he died, as she is shown at Karnak Temple with Nefertiti. Merit Aten's father, Amenhotep IV, became pharaoh when her grandfather died. They only continued to live in Thebes for the next four years. Her father began to show less interest in the plethora of Egyptian gods, in particular Amun, to whom Karnak Temple was home. Her father showed more favor in one god only, named Aten. The life-giving sun disk, he founded a new capital miles north of Thebes and named it Akhetaten, meaning the horizon of the Aten. He even went as far as to remove his previous name, which mentioned the god Amun, and changed it to Akhenaten, meaning the servant of Aten. It would be in this new city that Merit Aten was given her highest ranking positions. According to many, a northern palace at Akhetaten was built for a secondary wife of Akhenaten, whose name was later replaced with the name of Merit Aten. Merit Aten is depicted many times in the new city where she is venerating the god Aten along with her father, Akhenaten, and mother, Nefertiti. A very close relationship is visible between Merit Aten and Akhenaten during her younger years. On one scene, Akhenaten is shown gifting a golden earring to Merit Aten. It is known that Akhenaten and Nefertiti had six children together and only daughters. The secondary wife of Akhenaten, Kia, gave birth to the male heir, Tutank Amun, then called Tutank Aten. This would have caused some friction between Nefertiti and Kia. Very soon after the birth of Tut, Kia disappears. Did she die of a plague that tormented the new city? Or was she removed by Nefertiti? Some believe that Merit Aten, the half-sister of Tut, became his adoptive mother and raised him in the northern palace, which was formerly inhabited by Kia. Although the wet nurse of Tut was named Maya, some believe that Maya and Merit Aten are one and the same, but this theory holds little factual evidence, even though many artifacts belonging to Merit Aten were found in the tomb of Tutankhamun, from a clothing chest to musical clappers containing the names of Merit Aten and their grandmother, Queen T. Life in Akhenaten's new city was not the utopia that he had dreamed of. Plague swept through the town, foreign allies turned their backs, and the population 
were not as welcoming of the idea of only one main god as he had hoped. The final years of Amarna were very muddy, and much is still unknown. Nefertiti had become a co-regent with Akhenaten, but she appears to disappear in her older age. Perhaps she changed her name to the royal name of Nefernuaten. Out of the blue, a new co-regent arrives on the scene. Around this time, named Smenkara. Some even go as far as to suggest a bisexual relationship between Akhenaten and Smenkara. Smenkara became a short-lived pharaoh when Akhenaten died. High in the hills of Amarna, at the nobles' tombs, in one tomb of Meri Ra, Smenkara is shown giving tribute to Meri Ra, along with Merit Aten. In this tomb, we have a clear sign showing that Merit Aten became great royal wife of Smenkara. It is even possible that before things began to fall apart, that there were four rulers of Egypt at the same time. Akhenaten, Nefertiti, Smenkara, and Merit Aten. It is possible that she had given birth to two children, one sharing the same name as her mother, Merit Aten. A tomb for Merit Aten has never been found. A boundary stealer of her father mentions that she shall be laid to rest in the family tomb in the eastern mountains. But no sign of Merit Aten being buried there was ever found. We have no idea what the final fate of Merit Aten was. A new female ruler appears, and the two former rulers, Smenkara and Merit Aten, disappear. Did they die from the plague that ravaged the city? Were they killed to make way for the abandonment of Amarna and a new young pharaoh who became Tutankhamun? Did they give up the throne and move back to Thebes with the entire population of Amarna? Or were they simply expelled and left in shame? One may never know. The second daughter of Nefertiti is named Meket Aten, meaning protected by the Aten. Unsurprisingly, very little is known about Meket Aten. She first appears in Thebes at Karnak, in a temple built by her father Akhenaten, just three years before the family moved to the new capital city. She is then mentioned in year four and five of Akhenaten, on a boundary stealer of Amarna. Therefore, we can deduce that she was around seven years old at this time. This royal family are extremely close, and scenes show them in loving moments. Meket Aten appears on the lap of Nefertiti in one scene, holding hands with her mother, while two of her other sisters also join in. Whereas Meket Aten seems close with Nefertiti, her elder sister Merit Aten appears closer with Akhenaten on the same scene. In the tomb of her grandfather, from Nefertiti's side, Ai, she is shown holding a tray of offerings towards Ai. When she was around 15 years old, she appears again in several Amanan tombs, including the tomb of Hoi and Mary Ra. It is suggested that she married her father, Akhenaten, and became pregnant, but things seemed to end here for Mekhetaten. She died in year 14 of Akhenaten's reign which means she was around 17 years old. She was buried in a royal tomb at Amarna. Unlike the old view on death and rebirth in the next life, where you needed to appease several gods, Akhenaten believed you simply arrived in heaven and rose like the Aten's son from 
your devotion in this life. In the tomb of Meket Aten, the sad reality of her death comes to light. Her entire family is shown grieving for her. In a moment of extreme sadness, she is shown deceased under a canopy. The significance of her under the canopy is heartbreaking. The canopy at this time symbolized childbirth. What we understand from this scene is that she tragically died during childbirth, a time that was most feared by many Egyptians. Although the tomb is very badly damaged, another scene shows Akhenaten and Nefertiti looking over the dead daughter while Akhenaten holds Nefertiti by the arm. Outside of the room, we can see a woman holding a newborn child being covered with a royal fan. Many believe that this is the child that Meket Aten gave birth to. Very few objects from Meket Aten remain, yet one scribal palette can be marveled at showing the name of Nefertiti and her daughter, Meket Aten. A princess, a queen, a woman of the utmost terrible circumstances. The middle child of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. She is believed to have been born in Thebes very shortly before the royal family moved to the new city of Akhetaten, now Amarna. She was given the birth name of Ankesen Pa'aten, which she later changed to Ankesen Amun when she veered away from her father's religion. In her early life, along with her two elder sisters, she became one of the principal priestesses of the Aten and is often shown along with her two sisters. Akhenaten made it that the public had to worship the family and in turn the royals and mainly the pharaoh would pass on your prayers to the god Aten. It is suggested that she was married to her own father, a practice at the time which was not unusual. She may have even given birth to an inbred child sharing the same name as herself. Yet the child died from the plague that wiped out half of the population of Amarna. When her father died, during the short period of rule under Smenkara and Nefernuaten, Ankesen Pa'aten was married to her slightly younger brother, Tutank Aten. Again, not strange practice at the time, as they believed that inbreeding would keep the family lines stronger, as well as the religious aspect where the Amanan royals were divine in their own way. They could not marry out of the divine lineage. Ankesen Pa'aten and Tutank Aten appeared to be very close. They are seemingly trained to be rulers by Nefertiti herself, if the theory is true that Nefertiti lived on past Ankenaten. They are also cared for by Nefertiti's father, I. After a few short years, Tutank Aten was crowned as pharaoh when he was nine years old, and Ankesen Pa'aten was made the great royal wife, also known as queen. Only two years into his rule, Tutank Aten and Ankesen Pa'aten abandoned their father's city and moved back to Thebes and reinstated Amun as the chief god of Egypt. To affirm that they were distanced from Aten now. They changed the epithets of their names mentioning Aten to now mention Amun, becoming Tutankhamun and Ankesen Amun. The close brother and sister were then stamping their mark in Thebes, being shown on statues and reliefs together in the two main temples of Thebes, Luxor Temple 
and Karnak. Ankhesenamu is often shown in loving scenes with her brother, some engraved in gold where she is seen hunting geese with Tutankhamun, others where he pours out wine for his sister queen. There is a loving scene on a wooden chest which is aptly known as their wedding scene. A young Tutankhamun and Ankhesenamun are seen presenting each other with the lotus in a lush garden. Yet, the most famous of all of these scenes of the couple is on the throne of Tut, where Ankhesenamun is leaning forward, rubbing oils from a bowl onto her brother husband. We know that the couple tried to conceive an heir at least twice, yet these children suffered the same fate as her first child. Two mummified children from Tut and Ankhesenamun were found in Tut's tomb. Tutankhamun died around the age of 19 after a nine-year reign. Having no children, this left Ankhesenamun in a predicament. Her grandfather I, Nefertiti's father, wanted to become the next pharaoh, yet we have evidence that Ankhesenamun did not want this. Here at the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, they have some really amazing examples of trade relations between Hittites and Egyptians. The ancient Egyptians had very good trade routes to the north, including people of the Hittites, Amuru, and Assyria. And they used to send letters between each other in the international communication language, which was written in cuneiform, sort of looks like little bird scratchings. And one of the most famous letters is that of Queen Nefertari, that she used to send letters to the Queen uh, Pudahipa up in the north, and they had a very good rapport between themselves. But before Nefertari of Ramses II, Amenhotep III and Queen T used to send letters up there. Queen T was actually very instrumental in causing a good relationship between the two countries. However, as we go on, from Tel El Amarna, we have letters from Nefertiti and Akhenaten to the Hittites in the north. And this is where we see things start to crumble. During the time of Tutankhamun, he had very good trade relations at that time with the Hittites to the north. So much so that even Ankhesenamun wrote to the Hittites when Tut died and asked for one of their sons to be sent because she did not want to marry I, her possible grandfather who was an old man. And some artifacts have been found, not in Egypt, out of Egypt, showing Tut and Ankhesenamun. And on the other side, the Assyrian lion goddess who is connected to Sekhmet. Shortly after her husband died and before I became king, she wrote a letter to the Hittites stating that she did not wish to marry the courtier and that the king of the Hittites should send one of his many sons for her to marry and he shall become the pharaoh. Unfortunately, it appears that I was aware of this and once the Hittite prince arrived in Egypt, he was executed. Ankhesenamun married I whose first wife was dead already. A small ring showing the joint names of I and Ankhesenamun remains to tell this tale. Although I was in his late seventies and only ruled for a short time, during this short time, the then 20-something year old Ankhesenamun disappears from all records. Her fate is not known. The tomb of Ai in Thebes is thought to be the original burial place of Tut. However, Ai swapped the tombs, claiming the larger for himself. The decorations are very similar, and a scene in the tomb could be a final image of Ankhesenamun. Ai was an old man, yet on the wall there is a young man 
with the bodily features of Tutankhamun, and next to him is his great royal wife, wearing the feathers of Amun. This scene would appear to be Tut and Ankesan Amun, yet their faces and names have been hacked out. This scene of the couple showing them hunting geese, a symbolic image that was repeated several times by Tutankhamun and the unfortunate Ankesan Amun. Nefertiti's fourth daughter shares the same name as her mother. She is known as Nefer Nuatan Tasherit, or the beauty of the Aten, the younger. Nefer Nuatan Tasherit is thought to have been born around year nine of Akhenaten's rule. She does not appear in many scenes with the family, apart from one where she is shown as a young toddler sitting on a pillow, playing with her younger baby sister. The entire Amanan family are shown on this fresco from the main palace. However, the only surviving intact scene is that of Nefrenuatan Tashirit. Since the other's feet are still visible on the fresco, artists have been able to reconstruct the scene to allow us to imagine how it initially looked. She does, however, make two brief appearances as a young princess in a noble's tomb at Armana, where she is shown with her other sisters. She does not appear to have a high role in the family when it came to official duties, which is why she could possibly have only been shown in noble's tombs. Nefernuatan Tasherit was present at the death of her older sister, Mekataten, as she is included in the lineup of princesses mourning their sister's passing. This scene took place before the next two younger sisters were born, as they are not present on the scene. Many are uncertain of the ultimate fate of this princess. She may have been the Armanan princess shown on several scenes without titles, as many believe she died before Tutankhamun and Ankesenamun took the throne. Neferure is either the possible twin sister of Nefernuaten Tashirit, or she may have been born very soon after Nefernuaten Tashirit. The thought behind them being twins is that they are both shown at what looks to be the same age on a palace fresco. Both princesses are shown bold, with their defined eyeliner, as well as being adorned in fine blue lapis and gold jewelry. Nefernuaten Tashirit on the right, looking back at her sister, holding her under the chin, a loving image of Neferure and her sister. Neferure does not appear on many scenes with the royals. In the tomb of Mary Ra, she is shown with her sisters, giving offerings to the overseer. Neferure is depicted holding a baby gazelle and a single lotus flower while she still has her side lock, the sign of royal youth. The plague that swept through Amarna took many victims, including the other royals. One of the youngest victims to have befallen this fate was Neferure. The scene showing the death of Mekhet Aten has the royal princesses present, all except one, Neferure. It is likely that she is not shown in mourning because she like her elder sister, had died. We have a small rose quartzite statue of Akhenaten, but this is the, the artist's draft. He's drawn onto the stone what he wants to create. This is unfinished, and this is great because it allows us to get an insight 
into how Akhenaten's artists created their art. Towards the end of the Amarna period, much of the art was left unfinished. Like these two draft statues of two young Amarnan princesses. One clutching at a sistrum and a lotus. These two statues lead us closer to the idea that Neferuaten Tasherit and Neferure were twins. The final glimmer of the life of the young princess was found in the tomb of her half brother, Tutankhamun. Among the thousands of pieces discovered was a very small wooden box showing Tut's sister, Neferure, seated as a young child with her finger pressed to her mouth, a traditional pose for infants in the art of the Egyptians. Setebenra, the youngest and the last daughter of Nefertiti, whose name translates to Chosen of the Sun God Ra. Oddly, her name deviates from Aten slightly, yet still mentioning a solo deity. Could this have been a precursor to the dramatic reshift of religion and power in the country in the years to come? She was the last born child to Akhenaten Nefertiti, who appeared to have been trying to conceive a male heir. Born in year 11 of Akhenaten's rule, Setepenra makes her final appearance while receiving foreign tributes with her parents and her sisters. She is the very last daughter shown on a carving in the tomb of Merira. This princess tragically died at the age of six, before the death of Meket Aten, as she appears nowhere on these key family moments. There are hundreds of statues, inlays, and ostraca showing the princesses of the Aten, and many of these show a very young princess. Could this be the local artist's attempt for the short-lived princess Setepenra, a final recognition in mourning. We may never know, as so many of these pieces were damaged when the city was abandoned and remain unidentifiable. When we look at the busts and art from Amarna, we of course notice how strangely these people are depicted. That was Akhenaten's own art style, but let us look beyond that and look at the faces of these young princesses. Though we may not know who is being depicted all the time, let us remember the human side of these young women. Nefertiti is remembered through the image of her beauty, but like so many who wish to be remembered through their children, the outcome would have been the latter for one of the most mysterious and memorable queens to have ever walked on the sands of Egypt. After seeing the Amarna heads close up for myself, I feel like I've discovered Nefertiti's family. We might not know a lot about them, and there might still be so much mystery, but to me, I hope that I've brought them back to life for you. She is a truly enigmatic figure from the ancient world. Some view her as a trailblazer, others as a traitor to her religion. A woman who is increasingly identified by scholars as a pharaoh in her own right. Married to religious zealot and stepmother to Egypt's most famous pharaoh. She is the iconic Nefertiti. The material and textual evidence relating to her life has been the subject of study for more than 150 years, and yet the truth surrounding Nefertiti remains one of ancient Egypt's great mysteries. 
Unlike many rulers of the new kingdom, such as Seti I and Ramses II, whose expertly mummified remains allow us to learn about their lives and their deaths, Nefertiti's mummy has eluded Egyptologists. Many theories exist regarding her ultimate fate, while numerous conspiracy theories swirl online. But which should we believe? And which are even plausible? Now filmmaker and Egyptologist Curtis Ryan Woodside has teamed up with many of the leading experts in his search for Nefertiti in order to determine whether her mummy has already been found or whether her body has even survived the past three and a half millennia. We want to encourage the real Queen Nefertiti to stand up. Mummy 21B is actually a strong contender for Nefertiti. There have been lots of attempts to try and deny that Nefertiti could be the mother of Tutankhamun. Well, if we have a mummy, what can we actually learn from it? And it's likely that the mummies of thousands of royal figures were lost to history. Where is Nefertiti? It is a question on the lips of many Egyptologists. Has the mummy of Nefertiti already been found? The lead contender for this identification has, for many years, been a mummy found in an 18th dynasty tomb in the Valley of the Kings, known to archaeologists as KV-35. This mysterious mummy was not the tomb's original owner. Rather, she was most likely placed there some years after her original burial, in order to protect her from looting. This mummy was found in a side chamber of the tomb, alongside an older woman and a young man. The older lady has been identified through DNA testing of a lock of hair from Tutankhamun's tomb. She is Queen T, the grandmother of Tutankhamun and the mother of Nefertiti's husband, Akhenaten. We found that the mummy known as Elder Lady. This mummy, people said she could be Queen T because there is a hair found in the tomb of King Tut in a box. They took the sample of this hair and they analyzed that with the hair of this lady and they said they are matching. But also, this will, will never confirm that this could be Queen T. But with Yuya and Tuya, DNA and T, we are able to find out that she is the daughter. This elder lady, she's the daughter of Yuya and Tuya, and the wife of Amenhotep III. The identification of Queen T amongst this cache of three mummies has led many scholars to suspect that the other two mummies were members of her close family. In consequence, the mummy of the younger lady has been thought to be the elusive Nefertiti. Whilst the reburial of Nefertiti with family members would make sense, DNA samples taken from the younger lady would appear to prove otherwise. Professor Aidan Dodson of Bristol University has studied the younger lady in some detail whilst writing his book Nefertiti, Queen and Pharaoh, published in 2020. He has his own thoughts on who this woman may be. One of the Key questions, of course, about Nefertiti is what happened to her mummy? And this is very much tied in with the question about the identity of a mummy found in 1898 in the tomb of Amenhotep II, known generally as the younger woman or the younger lady. However, when the, a number of mummies were DNA tested and the results published in 2010, um, all this rather changed. The uh, results as published um, said that the uh, younger lady was not only the mother of Tutankhamun, but was his mother by a brother-sister marriage. 
Now, this presents a number of problems because neither of the known wives of Akhenaten, um, Nefertiti and Kia, um, are royal sisters. And if they were, that would certainly be included in their, um, in their titulary. And also that there is no sister of Akhenaten recorded as his wife at the time when you'd expect to find um, Tutankhamun being born. And there are also other sources at Amarna where if there were a third queen, you would actually expect to find some kind of mention. The same DNA signature in Tutankhamun, which would appear to come from a brother-sister marriage from his parents, is also to be found if you have three generations of first cousin marriages involved. But amongst the um, suggestions um, has been that Nefertiti was the uh, daughter of I, and that I was a son of Yuya, um, and therefore a brother of Queen T. Also, going back a couple of generations, there are other suggestions which would fit again, again, with first cousin marriages. The only thing to make this work genealogically for the younger lady to be Nefertiti, and also the mother of Tutankhamun, is for her mother to have been a sister of Amenhotep III. Now, there is no trace of a wife of I with that background. So, on that basis, one can produce a credible uh, um, family tree, which would make the younger woman first cousin, result of a series of first cousin marriages of Akhenaten, and most likely, I think, Nefertiti. And there have been lots of attempts to try and deny that Nefertiti could be the um, mother of Tutankhamun. That's only on the basis that she's only ever shown with daughters. But that ignores the history of Egypt up until that point, where kings and queens are only ever shown with daughters. Sons are never shown as part of a family group. So to almost uh, to ask for Tutankhamun to appear in these procession of daughters you find on so many of Akhenaten's monuments is really to ask for something which shouldn't actually exist up until that point in Egyptian history. It's only under the Ramessides that you find mass um, representations of royal sons and daughters. So on that basis, I think a reasonable case can be made for the younger lady being Nefertiti and simultaneously Tutankhamun's mother. The age of the uh, body has been estimated at between 25 and 35. Aging of ancient bodies of that kind of age is notoriously problematic. But between 25 and 35 actually works quite nicely for Nefertiti because she presumably will have married Akhenaten when she was in her early to mid-teens, say 15. Um, and then she has a career of the 17 years of her husband's reign, plus at least three years following on from that as female king at Nefenefruata. One thing the identification of this mummy with Nefertiti does, however, is says something about the way her life ended, because the body has very, very serious facial wounds. Thought to be caused by um, tomb robbers who hacked through wrap, who wrappings to get at the, um, the valuables. But when the body was CAT scanned a few years ago, the analysis showed that the, there were fragments in the sinuses which wouldn't have been there if the body had been a dried husk when it was damaged. That could only have got there if the body had been alive at the moment the wound was um, infected. That wound is so severe that it certainly would have caused massive hemorrhaging and probably deaths through um, blood loss or shock very, very rapidly. All of which would suggest that if, say, if this is a correct identification of it, and even if it isn't Nefertiti, it's still the mother of Tutankhamun, that she died a horrible death, whether by accident, design, or disguised um, design as an accident.
So therefore, this body is a fascinating one and throws up all sorts of interesting questions. But say, I think one can make a good case for it to be Nefertiti, although there is absolutely no sort of smoking gun and one can't say QED um, at this point in time. With scholars divided over the identity of the younger lady, where does this leave the search for Nefertiti? There have been other candidates over the years, yet the majority have been eliminated as dating from the wrong dynasty, or indeed due to the mummification processes employed, not even a hailing from senior nobility. This leaves just one remaining candidate from among the two otherwise unidentified female mummies discovered in an unfinished and undecorated tomb in the Valley of the Kings. I have my own thoughts on who the mummy of Nefertiti could be. The two female mummies in KV21 have not actually received much attention. However, in recent years, Egyptologists have started to take a closer look at these two mystery women. Sophia Aziz, an Egyptologist and mummy expert, has been investigating KV21 with some interesting results. The KV21 mummies sadly have been through a really rough ordeal. It's remarkable that they've survived at all. The tomb itself was first discovered in 1817 by an extraordinary character of Egyptology. His name was Giovanni Belzoni, an Italian man of great stature, strength and intelligence. He was known as an adventurer, an explorer, and to some, the father of modern Egyptology. He had an interest in hydraulics and even thought about becoming a monk, but he somehow ended up in Egypt discovering temples and tombs while getting involved in fist fights, dodging bullets, and competing with rivals. And when Balzoni discovered the tomb, he was in reasonably good condition, as were the two mummies within the tomb. He even describes their hair as long and well-preserved. This, however, all changed when the tomb was rediscovered in 1989. By this time, it was evident that the tomb had been flooded for a considerable length of time, so both the mummies would have been submerged in this water. Additionally, some graffiti was discovered, indicating that visitors had been in and out of the tomb, in fact, even the mummy's hair was now missing, probably taken as a souvenir. Now, it's quite incredible that the two mummies were still within the tomb. And this could be because the tomb was undecorated, it was uninscribed, and there weren't any clues really to the identities of these two mummies. So this could be the reason why they were just left there, which is actually quite sad the way they were sort of discovered, discarded, forgotten about, and then rediscovered. Now known as Mummy 21A and 21B, CT analysis was conducted. And the CT results are interesting. So by now, Mummy 21A had actually lost her head and her body her was in pieces. She had post-mortem fractures with some body parts missing. She was the younger of the two. Mummy 21B was determined to be in her 40s. Although she did have her head intact, her right eye was missing, her nose was missing, but it was determined to have been small and narrow. It also looked like her brain had not been extracted through the usual nasal route, and her heart was no longer in her body, but she did have resin-soaked pads within her body cavity. She also displayed signs of osteoarthritis, which would be indicative of a woman in her 40s. So, it, you know, it was difficult to really identify the mummies with a state of preservation. But looking at the age difference between them, Mummy 21A being in her 20s, the other one being in her 40s, it's quite possible they were mother and daughter, and this would this would reflect the fact that they were interred together as well. And what's also interesting is that they had bent elbows and clenched fists, 
which would indicate that they were both raw mummies. Between 2007 and 2009, molecular analysis was conducted of a number of mummies from the New Kingdom period. This was to see if they were related. Now, amongst these mummies was the famous Tutankhamun, the two fetuses discovered in his tomb, and mummies 21A and 21B. The technique used by the team was genetic fingerprinting, which looks at short tandem repeats. These are repeated sequences found within the non-coding region of DNA. So these repeats vary between individuals. So by comparing the repeats um, across a number of microsatellites, it's possible to work out whether or not people are related. Genetic fingerprinting is used in paternity, maternity tests, genetic disorder testing, identifying unknown human remains, and in crime scenes. So if you've ever watched a crime scene investigation series, you'll know that at the crime scene, forensic evidence is gathered. If DNA is successfully extracted, hopefully to find a match. The problem with ancient DNA is that it tends to be heavily degraded. And this is due to processes such as autolysis after death, when the body's own enzymes start to self-destruct. And also the burial environment can also have an impact. Chemical, physical processes can further degrade the DNA and of course, microbial attack. So all of these factors can really have an impact on the DNA. When the study was conducted and the results were released, this really left the academic field divided with those that thought it was possible to extract ancient DNA and those argued that it's virtually impossible. So the reason for this was, that at that time, extracting ancient DNA was still relatively new. And there'd been some studies in which it was claimed they had successfully extracted DNA only to find out it was due to modern contamination. The team, however, said that they took um, precautions. So they extracted the ancient DNA from deep within the bones, thereby trying to rule out contamination. Also, they had genotyped all the team that were involved in the study to rule out contamination. It was argued that it would have been more suitable to extract mitochondrial DNA. And this is because mitochondrial DNA, which is passed from the mother, is just better preserved than nuclear DNA. However, the team did eventually publish their mitochondrial results as well. But if we look at the data, so mummies 21A and 21B, we know that it's most likely the DNA would have been heavily degraded. If we think about the environment that they were in, being submerged in water, they were handled a lot, visitors were in and out of the tomb. So we'd expect the data not to really reveal a lot. And this was actually the case. The team were una unable to retrieve sufficient data. So this does actually reflect the fact that the DNA would have been damaged. The only way to reconcile the differences is probably to do next generation sequencing which is a more sensitive, high throughput technique, which is much more suitable for heavily degraded DNA. Now, if we look at the context of the burial itself, if we look at the location of the tomb, and we look at the fact that both these ladies were 
entered together. They both had these clenched fists and bent elbows. Quite likely that they were mother and daughter. And they would have been royal. If we look at Mummy 21B, she's in her 40s. She has that degenerative condition. And if we look at Nefertiti's portrayal in her latter life, she is depicted as an older lady. So Mummy 21B is actually a strong contender for Nefertiti. For me, the mummy KV21B is the strongest candidate for Nefertiti. If the DNA is anything to go by, it could be her. Even the mummy KV21A has been found to be the daughter of KV21B. Now, this could be huge, as we do not actually have a DNA source for Nefertiti. The headless KV21A has been linked by DNA results to the two stillborn children found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. That could only mean one thing, that the headless mummy KV21A is in fact the sister and wife and the mother of the two children of Tutankhamun. This mummy KV21A that I believe is Tut's sister Anke Senamun even shares some similarities with the body of Tut, including some of the genetic bodily deformations. If she is Anke Senamun, that makes KV21B her mother, and we know that the mother of Anke Senamun was none other than Nefertiti. Therefore, 21B could in fact be Nefertiti. The reason that we don't have a DNA profile for Nefertiti is because we're not actually sure who her parents are. She has been linked to be the daughter of Pharaoh I. Now you see, Tuya and Yuya had three children. They were Queen T, the royal astronomer Anan, and I. In Amana, I has been referred to as the god's father. This would indicate that he is the father of a daughter that has married the pharaoh, which would be Nefertiti. So this title links I to be the father of Nefertiti quite nicely. In my opinion, it is entirely possible that KV21B is Nefertiti. If you just look at the face of the mummy, and you look at the representations that we have of Nefertiti, the similarities are striking. Now, I am not in any way a forensic pathologist or an expert at facial reconstruction. However, I have my own way of doing an artistic representation, an artistic reconstruction of a mummy. When you look at KV21B, you first of all notice the long, slender neck and, of course, the strong jawline. However, you also start to notice the eyes. She has painted on eyeliner on the mummy in the thin style, which we can only associate with the bust of Nefertiti. Because KB21B's head has been damaged in later years by grave robbers, one of her eyes is actually missing. So what I did in my reconstruction process was I took the one eye on the one side, duplicated that, inverted it and lined it up to the skull. That way I could have a symmetric face to work with. Then what I start to do, I start to outline key features on the mummy. And what I started to notice was this mummy shared a lot of the lines on the face that we would associate with Nefertiti, such as the jowls by the mouth, also, the lines under the eyes are strikingly similar to the Nefertiti Berlin bust. Even the cheekbones and jawline lines up pretty well. Even the nose, eye shape, and the lips line up pretty well with representations that we have of Nefertiti.
I am in no way claiming that KV21B is 100% Nefertiti. However, for me, she is the closest contender. Have a look at the reconstruction that I have done and make up your own mind. This leaves us in a predicament, because you see, many Egyptologists are skeptical on the DNA results of KV21A and B. Some Egyptologists are still searching for the real Nefertiti. Today, we want to encourage the real Queen Nefertiti to stand up. We have to remember this is not a photographic likeness of the queen. There was no such thing as portraiture in the Western sense in ancient Egypt. The torso in the Brooklyn Museum of Akhenaten, and you can notice that the cartouches are all hacked out. That's because the ancient Egyptians did everything they could to try to erase his memory. Because the ancient Egyptians purposefully tried to destroy the memory of the Amarna period, it is important for us Egyptologists to try to enlist the service of other individuals to help us to try to reconstruct that period. And one of the ways we can do this is by asking individuals that are involved in medicine and genealogical research to come to our assistance and collaborate with us. Science in the service of the humanities is a very, very valuable tool and then trying to identify Nefertiti and other members of the ancient Amarna family, the two mummies that are suggested to be the physical remains of Queen Nefertiti. The first, KV35YL. Another set of human remains that are suggested to represent Nefertiti were KV21B. So now, as a typical in ancient Egyptian studies, we have a clash of titans, two camps. Are the physical remains in KV35, younger lady, the remains of Nefertiti? Or are the physical remains of KV21 B the physical remains of Nefertiti? And we know that she was not a twin. So one of these two identifications has to be dismissed. And here, in a nutshell, is how we unpackage the two theories so that you can make an educated conclusion about which of the identifications is the more compelling. And again, in 2019, the genetic markers of this mummy 
KV35 younger woman were compared a very compelling evidence that she is in fact able to be connected with that royal family. Now, as we look at KV21B, there were analysis that were conducted on this mummy in 2016 and 2021, but those genetic markers seem to be less numerous, and there are many, many more gaps in her genetic markers. By the fact that the DNA evidence did not support the identification of KV21B as Nefertiti, the proponents of that theory decided they would take another tack. And so they tried to press into service the use of a CAT scan and art historical data. And what they tried to do was to show that there was coincidence between the mummy and the cranium as revealed by a CAT scan. And so the method just described is academically flawed. So the two images that they chose represent an individual at two different stages in their life. And so it's inconceivable that a mummy can represent the two ends of a person's life, a younger and an older one. So in my opinion, the superimposition of the mummy and the cranium as a result of a CAT scan on two different images that do not necessarily represent the same face is open to serious academic scrutiny. Or will you base your conclusion on the preponderance of evidence that scientific genealogical data provides? The answer is up to you. Hi, Kara. Hi, Curtis. How are you? I'm great. And you? Good, good. Hanging in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> I, you know, I'm working on this new documentary and I, I was discussing it with you beforehand. And, you know, you had some pretty interesting views about it. And I just thought it would be great to have you share the your views in this documentary. So we're looking to see who are the candidates for Nefertiti's mummy. You know, what is your opinion? Or do you think she should still be a mystery? It's funny, there's all of this um, hemming and hawing and discussion about which mummy is hers. Mm -hmm. And some have identified her based on hair. Um, some have identified her based on DNA studies. Some have identified her based on location. And I actually just steer clear of the argument almost entirely. You know, just standing on the sidelines with arms crossed and, and scowling from afar, asking, well, if we have a mummy, what can we actually learn from it? Sometimes you can learn a great deal, sometimes not as much as you would like. Finding the mummy of Nefertiti, you know, what could it potentially teach us? Could it potentially sideline us into imposing certain theories or questions upon her. Mm -hmm. And I think that just the mummy of, of um, just the mummy of Hatshepsut and how much that, how much attention the finding the mummy of Hatshepsut seems to have drawn from scholarship has in my opinion, taken away from Hatshepsut's history, achievements and, and many other uh, issues that I think deserve more attention. So in some ways, I think the mummy chase is like the shiny thing over here. And I would rather be over here with my arms crossed, scowling, <laughs> looking <laughs> on outside. You want to learn more about what she did and who she was rather than, okay, there's the, the 3000 year old body. I, I don't, I, I say this to my graduate students all the time. I say it to my undergraduate students all the time. We should only be asking research questions that we have a chance of answering. And in the case of some mummies, unless there is a toe tag, unless there is a text assigned to this mummy, we will never truly know whose mummy 
is Nefertiti's. It's the same with Akhenaten. If these mummies aren't marked in some way that's definitive, there will always be some element of doubt. And we will always be unsure about which mummy is whose. And so given that this is a research question that we actually cannot answer, in the same way that I have students that want to write about Akhenaten, was he mad or strategic? Well, that's great. You can, you can touch that question, but you'll never be able to get to Akhenaten's psychological state because the Egyptians didn't leave anything about Akhenaten's psychological state. In the same way, if this mummy is not definitively marked, we can't know. And Nefertiti not being ostensibly a member of the 18th dynasty royal household, at least directly related, DNA studies are only going to be of so much use. And this is a circular argument of tail chasing that I would rather opt out of. If a woman's mummy is found whose DNA is linked to Tutankhamun, then why could it not be one of his sisters or, or somebody else in the family whom we don't know? Our attempts to find her may impose identities on mummies that are not her. It's not like the, the mummy of, let's say, Seti I or Ramses II, where we had their names on the bandages on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. This, is, this is basically all guesswork. Well, the, and the other thing floating about this research, Curtis, if I, if I may be so bold, is Nicholas Reeves' suggestion that Tutankhamun was buried in the foyer of the king who served before him. And the king who served before him was likely Smenkare. Smenkare's funerary materials have not been found in any way, shape, or form from the Valley of the Kings, which is highly unusual, and suggests that there is a tomb for Smenkare that we okay. maybe have not discovered yet, right? Yeah. And if you fit with, I would say, 30 to 40% of Egyptologists who are open to the idea that Nefertiti because she shares the Ankhepru Ray name and no other king is taking on the throne name of another king that would be a strange and aberrant thing to do. That Ankhepru Ray element does link Neferneferu Aten, whom we know is Nefertiti, with Smenkare. If Nefertiti is Smenkare, then we can be talking about this mummy identification all the time, but she may be hidden away someplace where we have not discovered her yet. That, that, dis, that theory of Nick Reeves haunts this entire discussion. And it is, it is a typical uh, ploy of researchers to say, but that tomb isn't here, we don't have it. My close examination of these scans highlighted the apparent presence of closed doorways on the west wall, potentially leading to an additional Tutankhamun period storeroom labeled X in the cutaway bottom left here and that on the north to a corridor continuation of the tomb labeled Y. The proposal I put forward was that the burial of Tutankhamun was actually a tomb within a tomb. And the fact that we cannot find her is as much of interest to me in what the Egyptians chose to remember about female power in particular. That's where I would rather spend my time. I also see this certainty that's imposed generally swirling about documentaries mm -hmm. uh, for television research, which I, I put research in scare quotes for that, and, and, and an ego driven attempt to connect a find, a discovery to a particular mummy or body and to create a, an arena of attention that, yeah. that draws the gaze to Egypt and to that particular discoverer. So to be honest, I, I don't trust a lot of this discussion that's happening. Yeah, yeah. That's why I wanted to have this, this discussion with you because when I make documentaries, I want to keep it open. I want to have different opinions. I want to have the facts. As Kara mentioned, Nicholas Reeves has his own theory that Nefertiti is still yet to be discovered in an undiscovered chamber in Tutankhamun's tomb. Now, this is a very controversial issue amongst many. However, until we know 100% for sure 
That too remains a mystery. It is possible that her mummy has been found already and is lying in a museum basement, uncatalogued. It could even be that she is in a private collection, or worst of all, she was maybe sold to a Victorian tourist and has since then been totally destroyed, as was fashionable at the time. Mummies have long been a source of fascination in the Western world, but what they used to be was kind of a commodity. It's long been believed that mummified bodies had magical properties. It was as if all the speculation regarding the mysticism and magic of the ancient pharaohs had literally become embodied in the remains of the Egyptians themselves. So mummies were used for esoteric and occult ingredients, love potions, health tinctures, that kind of thing. It was believed they had medicinal properties. They were even ground up and used in popular paint that was known as mummy brown. To think of this today is pretty shocking. I mean, the Victorians were consuming mummies, literally in a cannibalistic way. There's a level of dehumanisation and disregard for human remains that finds its pinnacle in the famous mummy unwrapping parties. By the late 17th century, the physical consumption of mummies was falling out of favour. But the cultural consumption was only becoming more popular. One of the first recorded public unwrappings of a mummy is from the early 18th century. It was undertaken by an apothecary known as Christian Herzog, and he later published his findings. This was a new approach lent credence under the banner of scientific discovery. The spectacle began to overwhelm the research as the 19th century took hold. Famously, it was an Englishman named Thomas Pettigrew, later known as Mummy Pettigrew, who popularised the mummy unwrapping party concept. Pettigrew became interested in the subject after assisting famous explorer Giovanni Belzoni in an early unwrapping party held for physicians. The popularity of mummy unwrapping parties swelled in the 1830s. Early Victorian audiences found the mixture of spectacle, death and scientific research to be an irresistible cocktail. The last mummy unwrapping occurred in 1908 by Margaret Murray. That's just over a century of the public ruin of Egyptian bodies. Countless mummies were destroyed and lost to the centuries of Western consumption of Egyptian remains. And it's likely that the mummies of thousands of royal figures were lost to history. Given that we've never been able to positively identify the mummy of Nefertiti, it's entirely possible maybe even likely that her remains were discovered, uncategorised and lost in this manner. I've been given permission to open the tomb of I, myself, with the key. It could be that her mummy is still lying inside her tomb, which is yet to be discovered. If Pharaoh I really is her father, it is possible that Nefertiti was buried in the Western Valley in Luxor, near her father I and her father-in-law Amenhotep III's tombs. Whilst it's entirely possible that Nefertiti's tomb, and indeed mummy, may still lie undiscovered beneath the sands of Egypt, it is equally possible that Nefertiti may remain, like so many aspects of ancient Egyptian culture and history, a tantalising enigma for eternity.
ancient Egypt brings to mind thoughts of splendor, grandeur and treasure. It's extremely familiar to us through mummies, pyramids and tombs, but not so often for the idea of internal family drama, much the same as many have today, just slightly more sinister. Although there are more well-known stories from the ancient world that we think we are familiar with, there are many that don't seem to make it into the mainstream. We all know the overtold story of Tutankhamun. Don't get me wrong, I love any new information on that period of time, and it is always beautiful to look at. However, I want to tell a story that has not received much to almost no attention at all. As many of us know, just how much of a disaster the end of King Tut's family was with all the politics and family strife. Although the next family line would be almost as complicated, if not more. The 19th dynasty, also known as the Ramesside period, is one of the only dynasties that we could possibly look at each successor's mummy, and using facial reconstruction, we can get an idea of the complete image of the family line. How did a young king and a female pharaoh bring about the final days of the Ramesside family? In this documentary, I will try and investigate the end of one of Egypt's largest families and how the legacy of Ramses the Great came to an abrupt end. So, where do we start? The final pharaoh of the 18th dynasty was Horemheb. Horemheb basically seized the throne from Pharaoh I, who had succeeded Tutankhamun by marrying Tut's sister after Tut had died. Yes, I know this all sounds extremely complicated and dramatic, but what else did they have to do back then? Horemheb, who had no children, appointed Ramses I as his co-regent, and finally, as official successor. The founder of the 19th dynasty, Ramses I, was born to a noble family in the Nile Delta region of Avaris, which was the Hyksos capital just a few years prior and was still occupied by many foreigners. His father was a troop commander and his mother was the overseer of the harem of Amun. Akhenaten disregarded all the other gods of Egypt in favor of his one and only god, Aten. Thus, by the time of Horemheb, the country was rapidly reinstalling all of the other gods of Egypt. The Hyksos, who were eventually expelled from their short rule of Egypt, had arrived around the 17th dynasty, over 100 years before Horemheb. The god that they found favor in was Set, the god of the desert, chaos, and foreigners. Ramses I was the high priest of Set. He was instrumental in the restoration of the old gods with Horemheb through his position of high priest of Set, as well as knowing Horemheb prior to him being a pharaoh as they both served in the army of Tutankhamun and Akhenaten. Ramses I was promoted to Horemheb's vizier when Horemheb, who was childless, saw that Ramses I had a son, Seti, and a grandson, Ramses, appointed him successor as he could see a strong religious and militaristic line of successors. 
Ramses I ruled as pharaoh for only around 17 months and did not have time to finish his many building projects, which would be carried out by his son Seti and Ramses II. He was buried in a fairly modest yet lavishly decorated tomb in the Valley of the Kings. The background of the tomb images were painted with a blue-grey colour, indicating the wealth of Ramses. He is shown directly in some of the scenes with many of Egypt's main gods and goddesses, affirming the gods were back. The mummy of Ramses I was first taken to Canada, then the USA, but it is now back on display in Egypt at the Luxor Museum. He died as an old man in his late 60s. His face still shows much of his experience and character. Seti I, named after the god Seth by his father and predecessor Ramses I, ruled for around 15 years. His reign can be seen as the ultimate period in Egypt's history, with many people moving to Egypt from foreign countries, as the economy was booming. Seti began his military campaigns against the Hittites during his father's reign. He re-established the old routes of the Delta via the fortresses en route to Canaan and Syria. During his reign, Seti fought several battles. He regained Nubia as a colony of Egypt and went north all the way to Turkey to expand Egypt's empire. Seti and his son Ramses had a close relationship, and Ramses would be by Seti's side most of the time, where he was learning how to rule Egypt from Seti. At the age of 16, Ramses accompanied Seti on a campaign into the north, where they defeated the Hittites and the Amaru peoples. Seti also went into Lebanon, where he went to war over trees. As you come out of the hypostyle hall, on the side here, it's the battle of Seti the First with Lebanon. And this battle was started about wood because Seti wanted these specific trees from Lebanon and the Lebanese did not want to give it to Seti. So he went in, he fought against them. You can see Seti riding in on his horse and his chariot, killing the people, fighting, and then eventually at the top, the leader of Lebanon surrendering and giving the trees over to Seti. And this was built by Ramses II to tell the story of his father. He wanted people to remember what his father did. And if you come around the corner, here we see Seti riding back on his chariot, showing different battles that he was fighting against, against all the other people that were opposing Egypt. And as he comes here, we see Seti crossing the Nile. And this is a great image because we see the Nile, we've got the reeds on either side, and in between we have fish and crocodiles. That's how you know it's the Nile. And as he comes back, the people of Egypt are offering bread and incense to Seti. He's got his captives. And here is Seti giving offerings back to Amun, saying, thank you, Amun, for giving me the strength to fight my battle. All of the campaigns would be successful for a short period. As by the time of Ramses II, when he became king, Battles were a necessity to maintain Egypt's wider borders.
Seti and his queen really instilled upon Ramses that it was extremely important to have as many heirs to the throne as possible in order to keep the family line on the throne for as long as possible. But was this the right direction to go in? As we will find out, having all these family members does not always equate happy families. How did a family of such strong rulers have their powers washed away under the waters of the Nile? In year 11 of Seti's reign, he elected Ramses II as co-regent. Thus, by the time Ramses, when he became pharaoh, he was well aware of what was required to make his rule a success. Seti began extravagant building projects throughout the land. If their legacy was in stone, it would last forever. That is actually how we know so much about this period in history. You have to remember that this is a new family and they were not of royal birth. This could be why they had to go out of their way with war and buildings to prove to the people of Egypt that they were worthy to be their kings and queens. Seti I built at Luxor and Karnak by expanding and starting the hypostyle hall and making the almighty god of the Egyptians, Amun, the center of their world again. He also built at Aswan Komombo, his mortuary temple on Luxor's west bank and buildings at almost every major site in the land. Yet his biggest building project was at Egypt's most ancient and holy site, Abydos. The Temple of Abydos. Here, Seti showed the wealth and splendor of Egypt and, at the same time, reaffirming its devotion to the gods. During the Old Kingdom, already 1,000 years before Seti I, Abydos was the primary burial place for Egypt's first kings and is known as the burial place of the god Osiris. Because Seti died young, around the age of 37, he did not complete his buildings. Even his own tomb, which would become the deepest tomb in the Valley of the Kings, would not be completed. Seti's mummy is extremely well preserved and is one of the only mummies from ancient Egypt that really gives us an idea of what an ancient Egyptian really looked like. Seti lived until he was about 37, and his cause of death is not entirely certain, although for the ancient Egyptians, living to 37 years old is actually quite a good old age, as the only average age was around 30 to 40 years old. Seti's mummy rarely allows us to imagine how handsome he really was. Seti I has one of the most beautifully preserved faces. He's very regal looking and looks incredible. So when he was CT scanned recently, it was discovered that he has a lot of subcutaneous packing. So 
this is in the face, in the neck, abdominal area, and various other parts of the body. So this is actually what creates this fantastic, realistic looking mummy. He looks amazing. When Seti died, his son, Ramses II, became Pharaoh. Born in the same town as his father and grandfather, Avares. Ramses was clearly exposed to several cultures at a young age. Already well educated by his father on how to rule, Ramses became one of Egypt's best pharaohs. Ramses' mother, Muttoi, was still alive by this time. She trained Nefertari, Ramses' first and chief wife, into becoming the ultimate queen. She also made a point of teaching Ramses and Nefertari the importance of producing many heirs to the throne. Ramses is famed for having over 100 children from various wives that we know of. But was this a wise decision? Ramses took up the challenge of completing all of his father Seti's building projects. We even have Ramses' words on how much these buildings meant to him. I have scarred both the upper and lower lands for only the finest craftsmen to complete my temples and those of my father Seti. Ramses used only the best to finish off all of his temples, starting with the Hypostyle Hall at Karnak. He completed the Seti Osiris Temple at Abydos, even dedicating a section to his grandfather, Ramses I. Then, Ramses began his own building projects building up and down the Nile. He built his temple next to Seti's at Abydos. And in Thebes, Ramses II built his mortuary temple, where we really get a sense of his vast family. And even a scene showing his grandfather. Ramses I writing his name and giving it over. To Ramses II handing on his royal name. Even though we don't have Nefertari's complete mummy, we get an idea of what she looked like. Ramses had many wives, but Nefertari was held above all. He built temples, statues, and the most beautiful tomb to her. In the tomb, we have the best idea of what she looked like. We know the Egyptians drew mostly in profile, however, using a frontal view of the eye. Many people think that ancient Egyptian art all looks the same. That could be because it is all so familiar to us, but by looking at the finer details to the trained eye, you can actually notice the differences between the depictions of different people. Like I said before, we can only imagine what Nefertari would have actually looked like. However, using her profile and statues and the depictions of her that we have, we can create a composite of what she could have looked like. Now, from the reign of Ramesses II, we find that the color of the mummy itself changes. So that dark brown blackened appearance of earlier mummies completely disappears during the Ramesside period. We also find um, a huge amount of resin is used. We find that resin is used to seal the eyelids. Sometimes we find wax in the ear. We even find nasal tampons that are saturated in resin once the brain is extracted. So it's an interesting stage of um, mummification.
Ramses is famed for his military prowess. And more so for his large family, but ultimately for his long reign. We know from Nefertari's tomb that it was actually her who chose the consorts for her husband. In essence, the more wives, the more children, the more heirs to the throne. And that meant that the legacy of the Ramesides would carry on for centuries. At least, that was the idea. The 18th dynasty prior did not really marry out of royal bloodlines, and that was what ended their legacy. The Ramesides, being non-royal, could in fact marry people from other families, which helped their bloodline to remain stronger. Ramses II lived into his 90s. His wife Nefertari had already died earlier in his life, and their children had also passed to meet with Osiris. Ramesses II, who is probably one of the most famous mummies from the Ramesside period. His mummy um, also displays signs of being embalmed to a very high standard. He was first um, studied by Croft and Elliot Smith during the early 1900s. And then in 1976, he was taken to France to undergo conservation treatment. And recently he's been CT scan. So he's been studied extensively. So we know quite a bit about him. So what we find is that his brain has been removed and his cranial vault has been filled with molten resin. We also find that he probably died between the ages of 87 to 92. And um, he should have had gray hair, but his hair's actually been dyed sort of a reddish blonde. Now it was initially thought that this could be the result of mummification, whereby the natron has dyed his hair blonde but um, a study was conducted by Egyptologist Janet Davey, and she found that um, natron, even mixed with henna, cannot dye the hair blonde. So it couldn't have been because of the mummification process. So it could be that the embalmers dyed his hair deliberately to make him look youthful for the afterlife. Everybody wants to look their best in the afterlife. It could even be that Ramesses himself was dyeing his hair during his own lifetime it's difficult to say but we do see other mummies from the new kingdom period with this fabulous blonde hair so who knows maybe it was just a color fashion at that time but we do know that Ramesses himself he did his natural hair was red before it went gray it was red When I first saw the mummy of Ramses II in person, I stood in front of him and I cried. I could not move for about 10 minutes. You hear so many stories about this man, but to actually stand in front of him, sort of face to face, it was as if he was speaking to me across thousands of years. And the strange thing is, there are so many men in Egypt that bear a striking resemblance to Ramses the Great. We have to remember he lived into his 90s and did age. We all age. Thank you.
it would be Ramsay's 13th son from his second wife, Iset Nofret, who would eventually succeed him. Meren Petah, the fourth pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. During his father's life, he became the overseer of the army and was ultimately named as Ramsay's successor in year 55 of Ramsay's reign. Meren Petah was trained by Ramses and probably fought in battle with Ramses at least once. He was probably around 60 years old when he became Pharaoh. In his fifth year, Meren Petah went to battle against the Sea Peoples, who had formed an alliance with the Libyans. This battle was a success for the Egyptians, who were able to keep their enemies at bay. He was married to his probable full sister, named after their mother, Iset Nofret. They had a son, Seti II, and a daughter named Tawazret. It is believed that Meren Petah was married to Takhat, and they had a son who would cause many internal family issues, named Amun Messi. Meren Petah did build and erect statues, but nothing on the scale of Ramses the Great. He is known to have a well-decorated mortuary temple between the Ramesseum and the temple of Amenhotep III. However, today it lies in complete ruin. Meren Petah died in his 70s and was buried in a large and lavishly decorated tomb based on a similar design to his father Ramses II and his grandfather Seti I. In the tomb, the full glory of the dynasty is evident, with Meren Petah at the center, with the gods. In only a few short years, their dynasty would encounter a sharp decline not because of war or economic problems, but because of family jealousy. Meren Petah's mummy is quite unique, the paint being applied to his face, particularly the eyeliner and eyebrows, which give us an indication of what the pharaoh actually looked like. Around his neck is a thin chain with what appears to be gold coins. He probably received this from Greece and chose to be buried with it as a reminder of his and his father's good relations with the Greeks. Unlike his father, Ramses, and his grandfather, Seti, Meren Petah does not appear to have had red hair. Upon Meren Petah's death, a short period of chaos ensnared Egypt. The general time of mummification is 70 days. In this period, Egypt is almost left in a state of limbo. Anything could happen. Meren Petah's son, Seti II, was meant to become the pharaoh. Although, with such a large family that Ramses had left behind, a direct son of Ramses II, would probably have seen himself as a better fit for the heir, rather than the late pharaoh Meren Petah's son. And as we know, Ramses had many sons who would have wanted the crown for themselves. This period in history becomes extremely complicated and hard to pinpoint the exact facts and chronology. Seti II was named Pharaoh. However, within the first year of rule, a rather obscure man named Amun Messi left Egypt divided. Some suggest that Amun Messi was the son of Takhat and Meren Petah, making Amun Messi 
the brother of Seti II. Yet some believe that he was the actual son of Ramses II, who felt that he was the rightful king and not Seti II. Although Seti II was named as heir by his father Merenpeta, it appears that some in the court supported Amun Messi and thus crowned Amun Messi as Pharaoh. Seti II and Tawazret, believed to be siblings, appointed a man named Bey as Chancellor. He was almost likely from Syria. Bey probably helped to remove Amun Messi from the throne and place Seti II back as full pharaoh over Egypt. Did Seti II kill Amun Messi, his own brother or uncle? Or did Chancellor Bey have something to do with the disappearance of the obscure, short lived pharaoh? But what physical clues did Amun Messi leave behind during his short reign? Statue of, according to the cartouche, it belonged to Seti II, but originally it was by Amun Mes. Both of them uh, had a struggle and conflict, ruling one at the north, one at the south, and Nubia, Amun Mes. And then Amun Mes had six statues in this hyper style hall at Karnak, and then it was taken by Seti II. It's very rare and it's far away from, as we can see. Uh, the name of Siti II, Wesser Hebrew Ra, Meri Emin, okay, and then Siti Meri in Beta. But actually, he left one of the clues at his statue over here the mother of Amun Mes and the wife of Siti II, Ta Khait, still over here with the two titles as a queen, as a princess, and as a royal wife, Saat Nisut and Hamid Nisut. The statue's head is now in the Met Museum in New York. We all know that families can have feuds and fights. However, this event seems to be a lot more sinister. No one is sure what happened to Armin Messi or how he died. We do not even have his mummy. It is accepted that Amun Messi shared his unfinished tomb with Takhat, presumed to be his mother, and his probable wife, Bakit Wernel. In his six years of being pharaoh, Seti II then made his move to remove all traces of Amun Messi, a foul reminder of his unfortunate reign. Probably extremely hurt by what a family member was capable of. Seti II never completed his tomb in the Valley of the Kings. However, the elements of the tomb remain and exude beauty and do not suggest any of the turmoil of his reign. He died in his late 40s We do have his mummy today, which allows us to see one of the definite last members of the Ramesides. Although there were still many members of Ramses II's family left to claim pharaohship, it appears that Chancellor Bey was determined to help keep the line of Seti II on the throne and thus had made provisions to have a young boy named Sipta, a son of Seti II from a minor wife, to be crowned as Pharaoh. Sipta was too young to be a real Pharaoh to a now failing Egypt. Someone older and more experienced was needed to help Sipta rule and maintain order against the 
ever approaching enemies who had focused in on Egypt's increasing weakness. Tawazret, the wife and sister of Seti II, took the role of co-regent. It was not uncommon for a mother, or even a stepmother, to step in for a young pharaoh to help rule and make decisions. Hatshepsut, the stepmother of Tutmosis III, stepped in for her young stepson, and finally she was named as full pharaoh, leading Egypt through some of its most precious times. Although Tutmosis was a healthy young man who could control the military around 300 years before Tawazret and Sipta. Tawazret did not have the security to lean back on. Sipta was a very ill young boy who did not do much. She had to be in complete control. However, did Tawazret want to be more than just a co-regent. It does appear that the Chancellor Bey did make an attempt to take the throne. However, this was stopped by Tawazret. An Ostraka found at Deir al Medina tells us that Bey was executed in year five of Sipta's reign. Why would he have been executed unless he had done something that went directly against the state. The Ostraka suggests he was executed directly on orders of the pharaoh. On this day, the scribe of the tomb, Pazer, came announcing, Pharaoh has killed the great enemy, Bey. Bey was afforded a tomb though, in the Valley of the Kings, a place that was only for royalty, apart from the burials of Tuya and Yuya, the grandparents of Tutankhamun. Clearly, Sipta was indeed grateful to Bey for helping to secure his place on the throne and thus awarded him a tomb, a great honor and a sure fast track to the afterlife. However, Bey was never buried in his tomb. It was later adapted for a prince from the next ruling family. Only two short years after the execution of Bey, Sipta's health became rapidly poorer, and he eventually died around the age of 20. Sipta's mummy is presumed to have been found in a mummy cachet, and if the records of his age and health suggest the mummy of the young man with deformed legs matches that of Sipta. Sipta's mummy even matches the resemblances of the family of Ramses II, even having light, wavy, reddish blonde hair. Sipta's mummy was studied again by Grafton Elliot Smith. When he Smith, he studied a lot of mummies. He carried out a lot of autopsies. What well, he found with um, Sipta, he found shortening of one of his legs and he also found gross deformity in his ankle. So having looked at this, Smith thought that perhaps he'd suffered from poliomyelitis. The only problem with this diagnosis is that um, the presence of poliomyelitis in ancient Egypt is still inconclusive, so we're not sure. The untimely death of Sipta cannot be seen as suspicious. However, it worked perfectly for his stepmother and co-regent, Tawazret, who did not have to contest with the now executed Bey and her deceased predecessor. She became a fully fledged pharaoh. As you might have guessed, in Egypt, a female pharaoh was not always accepted. Women had many rights, but they wanted a man to be in charge of the affairs of the country. Tawazret's Egypt was a far cry from the glory 
of her great ancestor, Ramses II. The workers protested, food supplies were running out, and the enemies from the north and south were approaching the borders to claim Egypt's lands for themselves. Tawazret ruled for a further two years, not knowing how to save Egypt. With family members fighting amongst themselves, she had no real support. Civil war had broken out, and people were up in arms over the state of Egypt. Ramses split family members joining smaller groups and all vying for their own power. Egypt was in crisis. The family line was so far spread out that no one knew who was meant to be the rightful heir to the throne. At the end of two years as full pharaoh, Tawazret died, only to be succeeded by the founder of the 20th dynasty, Setnakti. Now, we do not know if she died of natural causes or not. It only takes a stretch of the imagination. With all the uprising, it is possible that Setnakti was the grandson of Ramses II from a minor family line. Hence, why Setnakti was able to get power to seize the throne of Egypt. Setnakti's son was named Ramses III, and a long line of pharaohs after were named after their great ancestor Ramses II. Maybe as a way to try and bring back the prosperity that was around only a few years before. Tawazret had her own tomb prepared, an extremely beautifully decorated tomb, which she had extended from a tomb started by Seti II. However, she was not laid to rest in the tomb. Setnakti claimed the tomb for himself and altered many of the scenes showing himself, rather than the female pharaoh who had preceded him. Tawazret's presumed mummy was found in a cachet along with Sipta. She was found with many pieces of exquisite jewelry, rings, necklaces, bracelets, and diadems, all bearing her family members' names, such as Ramses II, Seti II, Sipta, and herself. A silver bracelet was found with the mummy, with a beautiful scene showing Tawazret and Seti II enjoying wine together. The mummy, presumed to be Tawazret, really indicates the beauty of a queen with her auburn hair curled into ringlets and what appears to be the indication that she had been wearing a tight cloth that was wrapped around her head that would have been worn under her crown. Is this the face of the final pharaoh of the Ramesside family? A female pharaoh fallen from grace, cut down out of pure jealousy. Ta was right. Why the 19th dynasty fell into decline? We have external causes for that. The peace treaty between Ramses II and Khatusili, the king of Hittites. After Ramses II passed away, the problems started. We have two powers rising up, Hittites and Assyrians. The Assyrians, they were enemy to Hittites. They wanted to gain power, so they controlled all the trade routes between Mesopotamia and Anadolia, and also their influence extended until Syria and Palestine. And they dominated, controlled all the sources of copper. They moved to attack Cyprus and other islands in Aegean Sea to get uh, the cover they needed to their industry. 
it's provoked the sea people to attack the Hittites and their ally, the Egyptians. So they attacked all the commercial ports in the Mediterranean Sea. They attacked the north uh, coast of Egypt and also the eastern coast. And also they cooperated and uh, coordinated with the Libyan to attack the western side of Egypt. All of this happened during uh, 30 years from Miriam Betah time until uh, Satnachet when he made his military coup to finish all of this chaos and the inner conflict between the 19th dynasty and started a new dynasty. During the end of the Ramesside period, we find that um, the economy is not doing so well, people are struggling, so this results in a surge of tomb robberies. So when the um, royal tombs are inspected by priests from dynasties 21 and 22, they find that um, the royal mummies have been pulled out of their coffins and have been sort of tossed aside and they're in pretty bad condition. So the priests take them back to the embalming house and have them restored re-wrapped, put back into coffins, and then reburied. The 19th Dynasty, a family line of rulers that started out from non-royal beginnings, raising Egypt to its ultimate zenith. Was over planning Ramses the Great's family to expand their own legacy too grand that the aim to not end up like Tutankhamun with no heirs, pushing them to produce as many children as possible, the exact reason that their own family turned on themselves. Ramses the first, Seti the first, Ramses the second, Meren Petah, Seti the second, Siptah, and Tawazret. These are the faces of the rise and fall of the great family of Egypt. This is Cleopatra, a pharaoh, ruler of Egypt. But who was she really? Too much focus on her sexuality, too much on her lovers, not enough about the real Cleopatra. Coming to Berlin in Germany, we can come face to face with this mysterious woman. Here at the Altus Museum in Berlin, in Germany, they have some of the most amazing Greek art, and they have something that I've really been looking forward to see, a bust believed to be Cleopatra. There is so much myth around her. Cleopatra's story has changed and evolved over the years, so much that we get lost when looking for the real facts surrounding her. What we're looking at here is a statue from a private villa in Rome, and this is a bust believed to be Cleopatra, Cleopatra VII, the final pharaoh of Egypt. She is identified as Cleopatra because she was discovered next to a statue of Julius Caesar. She does resemble the images we have of Cleopatra on coin form. 
And what's interesting, the images of Cleopatra on the coin form show her wearing this band across her head, the waved hair on the side, and a little bun at the back of her neck. So this very well could be the face of the Cleopatra. A woman who tried to save Egypt, a political figure, and an incredibly tactile ruler. A figure whose name and legacy is burned into the minds of billions, coming from a tenacious Greek Macedonian family. She had to fight and even kill for her place on the throne. A noble attempt to save a failing Egypt. Cleopatra was willing to do anything to retain Egypt. She bore children from two of ancient Rome's most powerful men. She was a writer, an inventor, a scholar. Thousands of years later, we're still talking either about the men in her life or what she looked like rather than her accomplishments. She left her mark during the final days of ancient Egypt. The seventh queen in her family to be named Cleopatra. Let us see if Cleopatra was black or not. Her story has been warped so much throughout history. From biased opinions to praise, yet who was she really? The heir to the throne had to be of pure Macedonian Greek blood. Keep her dignity protected. Everyone thinks they know her. Everyone has a different opinion, but most of those are modern based on films and misinformed playwrights. This is the reason why I've been searching for Cleopatra's tomb. I believe she deserved to be found. How much do we rarely know about the true Cleopatra? To learn about Cleopatra, we must go back a few hundred years to how her family actually arrived in Egypt. The year was 332 BC. Egypt had been taken over by the Persians, who had made life for the population of Egypt quite uncomfortable. However, Egypt's salvation was on the horizon. A power was rising up against the Persians. This power was based in northern Greece, known as Macedonia. His name was Alexandros, or as we know him, Alexander the Great. He wanted what the Persians had. He wanted to take over their expanding empire as it was making advances towards Macedonia. Alexander arrived in Egypt and chased Darius and the Persians out. Egypt and Greece had good relations for hundreds of years prior. Ramses II and Nefertari had good ties to Greece, though one Egyptian pharaoh in particular named Amasis in Greek or Achmos the second, who reigned around 550 BC, had made allies even more with regions of Greece, and even sent 1,000 talents of gold to help rebuild the Temple of Delphi after it was burned down. He also married a Greek princess, Landishi. It is thought that it is these good relations between the two countries that was the reason why the Egyptians welcomed the Macedonian Greek Alexander into Egypt with open arms, uncontested. He was then crowned Pharaoh and named as the son of the god 
Amun. However, some suggest that a mythical tale imagined in around 150 BC tells us that the last Egyptian-born pharaoh, Nekhtenabo, had not fled south from the Persian invaders, but rather north into Greece, where he disguised himself as the god Amun and impregnated the mother of Alexander. Thus. Conceiving Alexander the Great, this story is merely a myth and holds no historic merit. Though some say that it was because of this tale that the Egyptians welcomed Alexander. Alexander adopted Egyptian custom, representing himself as a pharaoh, a title that he was most proud of. Alexander only stayed in Egypt a few months, founding the new capital city named Alexandria on the Egyptian Mediterranean, and building several small additions to existing Egyptian temples. He left Egypt, went to Persia, and beyond. When Alexander returned to Babylon in 323 BC. He mysteriously fell ill, and shortly died after entering the city. With his recognized son not yet born, the rulership of Alexander's empire was split up between his courtiers. The half brother of Alexander ruled Egypt for a few years, with the then infant son of Alexander, named after his father, being only a figurehead and not. A real pharaoh, Alexander the Fourth was killed at age thirteen, and shortly after, another illegitimate son of Alexander the Great was also written out of the story. Other Macedonians made attempts to conquer Egypt, but it was Ptolemy the First who was crowned as pharaoh from Cyprus. Ptolemy the First. He was mastered in Greek, but after him, he starts getting messy and confusing. And this is because brothers were marrying sisters, uncles were marrying nieces, and fathers were marrying their stepdaughters. And in between these marriage unions, they were also killing each other. Ptolemy the First was an army general of Alexander and his personal bodyguard, and showed great support for the followers of Alexander. Who defended Egypt, and some vague historical accounts mention Ptolemy was a cousin or even a half brother of Alexander. Thus, Ptolemy became Pharaoh of Egypt and founded the Ptolemaic dynasty, the family that gave us Cleopatra the Seventh. To add further to the confusion. The men were all called Ptolemy, and the women were either Arsinoe, Berenike, or Cleopatra. So our Cleopatra is actually Cleopatra the seventh. Many years later, after the start of the Ptolemaic dynasty, their final pharaoh was about to emerge. Cleopatra's family tree is very complicated. In fact, to say it's complicated is an understatement. It's like navigating your way. Through a complex maze full of twists and turns and dead ends, and when you finally make it to the end, you're more confused and wonder how you got there. The year was 69 BC. Cleopatra the Seventh was born. She was said to become the most revered of all the Cleopatras. A very ambitious queen, a very intelligent queen, that she did learn languages. Was amazing. In that time, only men can go to study. Cleopatra was formally educated, most likely at the great learning center known as the Museum. Cleopatra was the first of the Ptolemaic ruler who speak Egyptian. She was born in Alexandria, Egypt, the only Ptolemaic ruler who learned and spoke the Egyptian language. So for me, in a way or another, she was an Egyptian queen. To me, as an Egyptian, this is how I see 
Cleopatra. Cleopatra, she was a unique person, and she wrote the hieroglyphs, by the way. And Cleopatra, uh, she spoke, for example, Aramic, Hebrew, ancient Egyptian language, uh, Greek, uh, Latin. Uh, and she cared about all the kind of knowledge, astronomy, philosophy of uh, ancient uh, Greece and ancient Egypt, and also uh, the religion of ancient Egypt. She knows all the gods. She have like large knowledge uh, about ancient Egypt. And the lady, she has a dig she had a dignity. Cleopatra had the best education available during the Ptolemaic period. Alexandria became the cultural hub of learning and it all began with the vision of Ptolemy I. He wanted to amass education and knowledge from all over the world and have it in one place and I think he got pretty close to achieving this. Alexandria attracted scholars from all over the world, some of the greatest minds ever. And during his peak, the Alexandrian Library amassed about half a million books. Every time a ship would come to the Alexandrian harbour, if there were any books on board, they would take these books, get them copied and then return them back to the owner. Egypt, apart from grain, also controlled the paper trade, so they became the greatest exporters of books. There was a whole institutional complex where they would they could gather and some of the greatest mind would share their ideas the ptolemies wanted to make sure that they stayed there so they gave them great living standards so this is the social educational environment in which cleopatra grew up and she thrived in this environment and excelled and i think she was a bit of a child prodigy and her father ptolemy the 12th saw something special in her from a very young age and he therefore trained her to become the next pharaoh he trained her to become fantastic at public speaking and she managed to learn nine languages that's remarkable and plutarch tells us that she flowed from one language to another with ease and she spoke them beautifully which makes me think that she learned these languages from a very young age. And not only did she excel in languages, she would have learned literature, astronomy, mathematics. And it looks like she had an interest in medicine as well, because there are some medical treatises which are assigned to her in dermatology. So she was a very exceptional, intelligent woman. Cleopatra's parentage is widely disputed. Many ancient sources have various opinions. Her father, Ptolemy XII, Uletis, was the son of Pharaoh Ptolemy IX. Uletis' mother is disputed. Cleopatra Selene is suggested, as it is known that she bore two children. His second wife, Cleopatra IV, is a candidate, but it is not certain. The ancient writer around 100 BC, Pompeius Trogus, has referred to Ptolemy Uletes as the bastard son, while Cicero makes mention of a half Greek, half Syrian consort being the mother of Uletes. This would make sense as Uletes spent most of his life in and around Syria. He wasn't that popular with the Romans. They didn't really, they, they held a lot of um, abuse his way. One of the insults that the Romans particularly enjoyed was to call him the illegitimate. Now, I've toned it down, but they said this quite a lot. Cleopatra I was actually born in Syria she was the daughter of the Seleucid king. Her mother was Greek and Persian, and she married Ptolemy V. Now, Ptolemy V's claim to fame is a Rosetta Stone, which, of course, is responsible for the decipherment of the ancient Egyptian language. So on this stone, he basically lists all his accomplishments, all the good deeds he did. 
he's basically letting us know that he was a great guy. And him and Clip out of the first have a daughter. And this is now Clip out of the second. But Clip out of the second goes a step further in that she marries both her brothers. So first she marries Ptolemy the sixth. And then when he dies, she marries Ptolemy the eighth. She has children from both her husbands. One of her daughters is Cleopatra the third. We on to the third now. Cleopatra the third ends up marrying her uncle and stepfather Ptolemy the eighth. And by this stage, Ptolemy the eighth is married to mother and daughter. I, it gets very confusing. And then Cleopatra the third. She has a daughter who is Cleopatra the fourth. Cleopatra the fourth is killed off by one of her sisters. And then we've got Cleopatra the fifth and sixth, who are a little bit more obscure. The Ptolemaic dynasty never conceived out of their own bloodlines. A noble foreign woman would have been looked down upon, but ultimately seen as passable. Cleopatra the seventh's mother is also a matter of theory and opinion. Two women are strong possible candidates. Cleopatra the fifth, also known as Trifania, was the sister and wife of Ptolemy the twelfth, Uletis. When they were married, a papyrus mentions their joint titles as Theo. Philipatros Kai Philadelphoi, which means of the father, brother and sister, the loving gods. She is also mentioned at two temples in Egypt, at Philae and at Edfu Temple, where she is called the daughter of the sun, mistress of the two lands, and female ruler. It is highly probable that her mother is the same woman as her brother. Cleopatra V, her father was probably Ptolemy the Ninth or Ptolemy the Tenth, but she's believed to have married Ptolemy the Twelfth, who is Cleopatra the Seventh's father. Cleopatra the Fifth disappears from the records shortly after Cleopatra the Seventh is born. So it could be that. She died in childbirth. It could be that she was exiled, or perhaps she just didn't do anything that remarkable to be written about. In 305 AD, the philosopher Porfiry talks about Cleopatra V dying in 69 BC during childbirth. This would have been the birth of Cleopatra VII. He goes on to mention that a daughter sharing the same name went on as co-regent while the father of the great Cleopatra was exiled to Rome. Strabo's account contradicts this, saying that Cleopatra V was the one who co-ruled with her daughter Berenice while Ptolemy was exiled to Rome. Other texts suggest Cleopatra as having a half-Greek, half-Egyptian mother, who was a priestess of Ptah. Others suggest her mother was a half-Greek, half-Syrian woman that her father had known. Neither of these two women can be confirmed to having ever existed. Do you think that it would have been okay for them to have concubines because they were so, so focused on keeping the bloodline within the family? The, the inbreeding was uh, off the hook. I mean, Tutankhamun was also a victim of... Um, Completely inbreeding. inbreeding. Do you think they were allowed to have concubines? No, I'm, 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 I'm not aware of it. And I'm, um, what, I, I am, what I am aware of is that always the, the heir to the throne had to be of pure uh, Macedonian Greek uh, blood. Yeah. So even if they had concubines on the side, the children of these concubines probably got nowhere in life. If her mother was an Alexandrian priestess, 
this, I don't think Cleopatra would have been, would have had the access to the throne. The Syrian mother theory holds more bounds. Since this is where Cleopatra fled to after conflicts with her brother. Yet the candidate of the wife of Ptolemy Oletis, known as Cleopatra V, is more likely considering the amount of inbreeding to keep the bloodlines pure. So if Cleopatra was illegitimate, the Romans would have been shouting this from the rooftops because the Romans that are responsible for her history are Romans that either detested her or had their own biases or their own agenda. And there isn't a single writer that says she was illegitimate, which means that she must have been born to Ptolemy the Twelfth's wife. So the only wife that we really know of is Cleopatra the Fifth. If her mother had died in childbirth, then why should there be any mention of her? If her mother did oust her father and herself to Rome, why would there be any mention of her as a disgraced member of the family who turned on her own relations? as was a custom of the Ptolemaic rulers. Let us see if Cleopatra was black or not. The big uh, question. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say? First of all, I am not against the black at all. But I would like to give facts about Cleopatra. Because look at the Mac Macedonian queens and Macedonian princesses. There is no one who was really black. At the same time, look at all the statues that was made for Cleopatra. At least I know about two statues for Cleopatra. And all the coins that I discovered inside with Catherine Martinez, the temple of Betuziris Magna, it do does not show at all that Cleopatra was black. And I want to come to a very important point. It is not good to change history. It is not good to make a false history. Again, I am not against the black at all. If Egypt history was black, I will say that. But let us see if you, anyone will come and look at the scenes that shown on the temples of the new kingdom and the old kingdom and the middle kingdom. You always see the king smiting the enemies of Egypt. And the enemies of Egypt were actually Asiatics, African, and Libyan. Then we have five people in front of him. If you look at the face of the king and the face of the other enemies of Egypt, there is no one can say that the Egyptians were black at all showed themselves as unique, as yes. Egyptians. The Egyptians were unique and they were different. We know in Dynasty 25, we know that Kush and Nepta ruled Egypt. And we have the first king who came was Banchi and Taharka and others. Then the, the black kings came to rule Egypt in the late period. They did not have anything to do with this great civilization, such as building tombs and temples and pyramids. If you look at the Meroitic pyramids that built in Sudan, it's not like the great pyramids that built in Egypt. Then we have to know that the black civilization, its origin was in Sudan and Nubia. And I would like to mention here, there are some people who tried to, to show that the origin of Egyptian is black. For example, uh, we have two people from Brazilian came to the Civilization Museum and they took a photograph of a skeleton that was found in a small village near Sohag in Upper Egypt. 33,000 years old skeleton, which I had uh, the opportunity to, uh, to CT scan uh, uh, as well. He worked in quarries and we can tell that from the changes 
that his work caused on his uh, his elbows as well as in his knees and the and and, and the tella. These are of the oldest skeletons in Africa. This two Brazilian took photographs of the skeleton and they went to Brazil and produced a false scenario that this skeleton was black. How can anyone on earth it's not scientific find out if this skeleton can be black or white? Mm -hmm. Also, when I was visiting uh, Brazil, they do every year a parade. In this parade, it's celebrating that they are the origin of the Egyptians, but that's not true. Again, the black Kushite and the people in the south ruled Egypt in the late period, which is dynasty uh, 25. I remember when I went to give a talk in Philadelphia, and I did say what I'm saying now. Many blacks were very upset with me, and they had a march against me. Again, I am not saying at all. I'm not against the black at all. But most of my good friends are really black. But I won't hear to say the truth that Cleopatra was not black. Según todos los vestigios arqueológicos, Cleopatra era de la raza caucásica. Tenemos las pinturas, los relieves, las estatuas de la gran reina de Egipto, Cleopatra. Todos confirman que Cleopatra fue de la raza caucásica. Con todo el respeto a la raza africana, Cleopatra no era africana. Cleopatra era caucásica. Y para dejarlo más claro, la raza caucásica es la raza que habita el norte de África, el sur de Europa. Cleopatra lo era. Cleopatra era de Macedonia originalmente y nació en Egipto. De nuevo, según todos los vestigios, Cleopatra era egipcia, era de la raza caucásica del norte África. Coins from her time would show her with typical Greek facial features. Uh, there is a debate over who her mother was. Uh, her mother might have been an, an Egyptian priestess from Alexandria. Here is where the debate comes. Ancient Egyptian does not necessarily mean black. Um, ancient Egyptian society was a multiracial society uh, the same way it is today. We are a multiracial society, excluding Egyptians uh, um, that, that are not of a darker skin tone from their heritage is not okay. And uh, Africa is a huge continent. Africa is a Africa is not all, or, or is not only black. I I'm Egyptian. I'm quite dark, but I have cousins and and family members that look like you. Uh, they have colored eyes and they're white and they're still Egyptian. If we look at the Fayum portraits, for instance, the Fayum portraits for a long time they were thought to belong to uh, Greek uh, uh, inhabitants of Egypt. But recently they did DNA tests on the mummies where these portraits were 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 placed on, and they all turned out to be Egyptian. And uh, Egyptians um, came in all shapes and in all colors from very, very dark to very light and Africa comes in all shades and all colors C culturally appropriating uh, a civilization or a culture to a certain specific skin color is not acceptable but they're still African I'm still African you are still African Curtis because yeah. because you're South African Egyptians that are of pale skin are still um, Afri African Africa is inclusive Africa is all of us um, Egypt is inclusive, and referring to a certain civilization or a certain culture as black civilization or black culture, I think this is something to do with Americans' history and not the history of Africa. Africa has always been uh, a multiracial continent and it always will be. Ulatis, who was living in Syria before being recalled back to Egypt and named as Pharaoh, then faced the threat of Roman invasion. He was good friends and allies with Rome, Julius Caesar, and Pompey. He made a trade deal to keep the Romans from invading. A deal that cost one entire year of revenue of the entire Egypt. Naturally, however, this caused the Egyptian people to suffer greatly financially. He was then exiled to Rome taking his daughters, Cleopatra VII, and Arsinoe with him. 
Ptolemy XII's eldest daughter became Pharaoh. In 55 BC, with assistance from Rome, Ptolemy returned to retake Egypt. He killed his daughter Berenice IV and was recrowned as Pharaoh. Two years later, he named his next daughter as co-regent Cleopatra VII. A year after that, Ptolemy died. Cleopatra was not an Egyptian. Cleopatra was a Ptolemaic lady. She was the last ruler of this dynasty. We know that the Greek people lived in Egypt for 300 years, and their role ended on 30 BC. And Cleopatra was the last queen. Cleopatra's father was Ptolemy number 12. And he, when he died, he wrote in his will that Cleopatra and her brother, Ptolemy number 13, should be ruling Egypt. When Cleopatra became co-regent with her brother, Ptolemy XIII, she would have been around 18 years old, and her brother was only 10. She took up the role as dominant ruler, since her brother was way too young to make decisions. We have seen this happen 1,400 years before, during the 18th dynasty, where Hatshepsut took up the role of Pharaoh, since her stepson, Tutmosis, was too young to rule. This was nothing uncommon in Egyptian history. Do you think she had an easy upbringing living with the Ptolemies? No, no. No, she did not. I mean, she had, she witnessed her own sister being murdered by her own father. So, no. After her father's death, Cleopatra took over an, an unstable country. She established her own political agenda and strengthened Egypt's economy, producing a wealthy kingdom. Cleopatra was an acute political leader, as well as being a charismatic brave and capable ruler for 20 years. Cleopatra began attempts to revitalize Egypt's economy, changing the taxation laws for grain and various other agricultural reforms. She also proceeded forward with the construction of the largest temple at the site of Dendera on a temple that her father was not able to complete. Dendera Temple is the only intact temple of Cleopatra that we can marvel on today. The most decorated ceiling in all of ancient Egypt is here at Dendera. With the interior painted in a vivid turquoise color, the terraced temple is gloriously decorated and dedicated to the goddess of love and beauty, Hathor. Then, an event occurred that would win over the displeased Egyptian population. The sacred bull in the temple at Hermathis, near Thebes, had died. Cleopatra sailed down from Alexandria to Hermathis with a replacement bull. This event was commemorated on a stela where we see Cleopatra dressed as a male pharaoh and she is seen giving offerings to the bull. Another stela was erected in Fayum by priests showing Cleopatra dressed in male attire offering to the goddess Isis, a sign that the Egyptians were connecting Cleopatra to Isis more closely. It seems these types of happenings angered Cleopatra's brother and his advisors, and only after one year of co-rulership, Cleopatra is tumultuously chased out of Egypt and fled to Syria. Ptolemy XIII then became a full pharaoh at the age of 12. While living in Syria, Cleopatra garnered up many supporters, 
and two years later, with her new army, she returned to Egypt to attempt to take back the throne. The plan was flawed. However, the gods were in her favor. General Pompey had fled to Egypt. Julius Caesar followed. Pompey was killed, and Caesar was able to wager some sort of peace between Cleopatra and her brother Ptolemy the Thirteenth. Hidden in the desert for a year, she smuggled into the royal palace while rolled up in a carpet and was revealed to Julius Caesar, the renowned Roman politician and army general. Cleopatra consulted with Caesar on how she would get the throne of Egypt back. It was during this time that Cleopatra became entangled with Caesar. Their love affair bloomed while they lived together during the backlash from General Pompey's devoted followers, which Caesar eventually defeated from Alexandria. During their stay together, Cleopatra became pregnant. Cleopatra knew that if she became the lover of Julius Caesar and had a child with him, especially a son, this would offer Cleopatra a certain level of protection. So she was very clever in her way of doing these kinds of things. And she knew that Julius Caesar would be less likely to invade Egypt and, you know, conquer Egypt from his love and his son. Yet, Cleopatra was not yet back on the throne. How would she accomplish this? Her sister, who has claimed herself as Pharaoh alongside Ptolemy the Thirteenth, tried to besiege Caesar and Cleopatra. She did manage to regain some power and killed the army general and instated herself as first in command of Egypt, an act that offended Caesar and Cleopatra. Caesar, seeking revenge, assisted Cleopatra in killing Ptolemy the Thirteenth. It is written that he simply drowned in the Nile, which at that time is simple code for he died. Cleopatra was willing to do anything to retain Egypt. Caesar did have certain ultimatums for Cleopatra. She was to ceremonially marry her next brother, Ptolemy the Fourteenth, who was around 11 years old, but she still retained royal power. This way, there was still a male figurehead, as Romans valued males more. Cleopatra was also ordered to pay more tributes to Rome for allowing her family to remain on the throne. After agreeing, she was re -pharaohed. A son was born, Caesarion. Cleopatra then invited Caesar on a cruise down the Nile where she showed off the beauty of her country and escorted him around Dendera Temple. This would have been where Cleopatra showed off a special scene at the back wall of the temple she was commissioning. The most famous scene of Cleopatra uh, that shown at the entrance of the temple of Dendera, the temple of Goddess Hathor, goddess of beauty and love, it shows her with her son. And here we have the main pharaoh of this temple, Cleopatra the Seventh, with in front of her is Caesar. Next to Caesar is their son, presented as the son of Hathor, since Cleopatra was Hathor Isis on earth. Ibi, the son of Hathor here, is in fact the son of Cleopatra and Caesar, Caesarion. 
On the opposite wall is Cleopatra shaking a sistrum with a man in front of her who is burning incense to the gods. This man is a representation of what she hoped Caesarian would grow up to be. This is one of the best images that we have of Cleopatra, one of the only remaining images. And above her is her name. On the left, left cartouche actually, spells out the name of Cleopatra. C, L is the lion, E is the reed, O is the, is the rope, Cleo, Cleo, P is the, the box, Cleo, Pa, A is the bird, and then we have hand, and that is actually the D sound, not the T sound. So we have Cleopadra, Cleopadra. So we might actually be pronouncing her name incorrectly. It's not Cleopatra, because clearly written here in hieroglyphs, it is Cleopatra. In 46 BC, Julius Caesar had fully destroyed the followers of General Pompey. Caesar returned to Rome for a lavish celebration, where he had a parade of foreign enemies that he defeated. Cleopatra accompanied Caesar to Rome for this event. One enemy of Caesar in particular was paraded through Rome. Cleopatra's sister Arsinoe, who had made moves against Cleopatra, was chained up and humiliated in the parade alongside a scaled replica of the Alexandria Lighthouse where Arsinoe and the army attacked Caesar and Cleopatra. Arsinoe was then exiled to modern-day Turkey. The year 44 BC would mark a major turning point in the life of Cleopatra. On another visit to Rome, Herself, her son Caesarion, and Ptolemy stayed at Caesar's personal villa. We know that she lived in Rome for almost one year with Caesar. The returning presence of Cleopatra with Caesar's son was not welcomed. When Cleopatra arrived in Rome, how do you think she was received in Rome? We know that there was some sort of a big parade happening at her arrival, and uh, we d there is a letter from a bystander. He said that he'd never seen dotted camels in his life before, and by dotted camels he meant giraffes. So she had giraffes in her parade. So it, it must have been quite a circus, really. I don't think she was well received uh, by the Senate, that's, that, that, that's for sure. And I don't think she was well received by Julius Caesar's wife either. At the villa, Cleopatra meets the writer, Cicero, who had nothing but bad things to say about the Egyptian female pharaoh. Cicero called Cleopatra arrogant, and this is where we first hear him name Cleopatra as Caesar's Egyptian whore. The ancient Roman writers really did not like Cleopatra that much, and it's understandable if we think about the times that she was living in. Rome valued men way more than women. So by calling Cleopatra the Egyptian whore, it is an insult to her. They saw Cleopatra as a threat, and that is why they wrote such bad things about her, because they couldn't believe that a woman was in charge of such a rich and abundant country such as Egypt. And so the only way they could justify this was by calling her Caesar's Egyptian whore, the woman that got Caesar to allow her to retain Egypt. So that's really where we get this misconception. Cleopatra had two boyfriends in her, in her entire lifetime. How does that make her a whore? On this visit, Caesar goes as far as to erect a statue of Cleopatra in the Temple of Venus, portraying the queen connected to the Egyptian goddess Isis as Venus herself. Cleopatra is one of the most intriguing historical figures 
but sadly her story is one that is written by men and men that despised her or had their own biases that shaped their narrative of her. She was, after all, considered an enemy of Rome and those writing about her lived in an empire that was founded on her defeat. So we're left with convoluted versions of who she actually was. It's interesting that her life is depicted to center around two very powerful men. But I'm more interested in the gaps where these two men are not in her life. Was her story there? Because she was so much more than these two men. If we read between the lines, we get glimpses of admiration for her. Admiration for her intelligence, her magnetic personality and her charm. That's the part of her life that I'm more interested in. And it's also interesting that even in the modern era, the focus has shifted a lot back onto her looks. What did she look like? Was she beautiful? And in the age of social media and filtered images, what's considered beautiful, the bar has been set so high that it's become unachievable. So I find it really interesting that thousands of years later, we're still talking either about the men in her life or what she looked like rather than her accomplishments. So if we look at writers such as Dio, for example, who was writing in the third century AD, he describes her as stunning in the prime of her youth. So he's ageist as well. And even when he's describing Antony's funeral, again, he's talking about what she looked like. And then we've got Octavian, who in his propaganda describes her as a beautiful witch who cast a spell on Antony, taking away any form of responsibility from Antony. Even the same with Caesar, she's described as using her looks against him. Whereas she was only 21, he was a man in his 50s, a known womanizer, lots of experience, very powerful. So it's interesting that all the blame shifts to her. I want to hear the other story of Cleopatra. I want to read between the lines and know more about her, her academia, the languages she spoke. I want to know more about that part of Cleopatra. It was on this fateful visit that Julius Caesar was assassinated on March 15. 44 BC. Cleopatra, who thought that her son Caesarion would be the successor to Julius, stayed in Rome under protection for one more month. The minute she discovered that Julius's cousin was named in his will as successor, Cleopatra, Caesarion, and Ptolemy XIV fled back to Alexandria in Egypt. Not to be outwitted, Cleopatra, shortly after returning home, knew that her then teenaged brother would try to take full control of Egypt and herself, as was the custom of this complicated family. She poisoned her brother with aconitum, or as we know it, wolfsbane. Cleopatra, being astute in alchemy and medicines, would have known that lacing food or drink with the root of wolfsbane would have caused her brother a fast death. Cleopatra and her physician had experimented on criminals with poisons. So she knew that the wolfsbane would make her brother's tongue swell, his throat close, and paralyze him. He would not be able to call out for help, and there would be no trace of bodily harm. Upon her brother's death, she declared herself and her infant son, Caesarion, as co-rulers over all Egypt. During this time, Cleopatra began to take on the role as reincarnated Isis even more seriously. She had the giant image of Isis carved onto the main pylon at Philae Temple. But in actual fact, the woman standing behind Horus, shown with a fuller face, fuller, fuller body, is actually Cleopatra VII. 
in accordance with Egyptian mythology, Cleopatra was born of goddess. She was believed to be the human incarnation of Isis, the most powerful female deity of ancient Egypt. The goddess Isis was worshipped by the Greeks and by the Romans as well. Her cult spread throughout the Mediterranean. And here we have the Isis goddess shown as a Greek woman with an Egyptian headdress. The heir of Julius Caesar was a young, unwell boy, Octavian, and thus another Roman was set in charge of the provinces of Rome. He was Mark Antony. Very soon after Cleopatra's return to Alexandria, Octavian had asked Cleopatra to send aid for his war against the assassins of Caesar. Cleopatra, in turn, not wanting to cause issue with Rome, accompanied a fleet of her ships and soldiers to Greece, but arrived too late to assist in the fighting. I really believe that uh, Cleopatra tried to have Octavius on her side. By 42 BC, Mark Anthony defeated the troops of Caesar's assassins. Octavian was in control of the Western Empire, Mark Anthony, his nemesis, in control of the East. Mark Anthony summoned her to come to Turkey so that they could discuss the future of Egypt within Rome. He also wanted to confront her about her assistance towards Octavian. This notion of Octavian would have frightened the Queen immensely. Cleopatra delayed her leaving to Turkey as she had a tactic. She wanted to increase the anticipation of Mark Anthony. Eventually, she set sail for Turkey. Cleopatra arrived on her mythical barge and was dressed in full Egyptian goddess regalia. Her plan to impress Mark Anthony had worked. She had him in her hand. By having Mark on her side, he changed her status from a protected province to an independent monarchy. Abandoning his own wife in Rome and totally besotted with Cleopatra, Mark Anthony goes back to Alexandria with his new love. It is there in Alexandria that Cleopatra goes above and beyond to keep Mark Anthony impressed. She threw lavish feasts and debaucherous parties, some that went on for days. At these events, Cleopatra would appease the patron god of Mark Anthony, Dionysus. In 40 BC, Cleopatra gave birth to twins. She named these children of Mark Anthony as Alexander Helios, their son, and Cleopatra Selene, their daughter. Soon after, Mark was summoned back to Rome to make new ties with Octavian. He was to marry Octavian's sister, remaining in Rome for three more years. Conflicts between Octavian and Mark Anthony rose to a pinnacle. Mark Anthony left Rome and returned back to Cleopatra. He asked Cleopatra to fund his campaigns against Octavian and the East. Surely not impressed with the return of the father of her children who had gotten married while away in Rome. Cleopatra agreed, however, she did have terms. She wanted to make sure that Syria and Lebanon were given back to Egypt. She also wanted the assurance that her disgraced and exiled sister, Arsinoe, would be executed. The war against Octavian was retracted. His sister had died, and this caused a temporary peace between Octavian and Mark Anthony. Other wars were still on the go. 
Cleopatra accompanied Mark on a campaign against the Parthians. After many weeks making it to the border of the Euphrates River, Cleopatra was advised to return back to Egypt. She was now pregnant again, and in 36 BC, she gave birth to another son by Mark Anthony, named Ptolemy Philadelphus. In our modern view, some of the actions of Cleopatra could be seen as a political maneuvers rather than mere seduction. And I'm talking about her establishing relationship with Roman leaders, Caesar and Mark Antony. And this was to keep the independence of Egypt. Mark Antony's battle against the Parthians was a disaster. They lost the battle. He retreated to Beirut. Cleopatra traveled north to meet with him and his troops. She advised him that it would not be wise to return to Rome after such a defeat. He returned with Cleopatra to Alexandria, where he met his new son. Cleopatra and Mark Anthony had big plans together to rule their known world. They had asked the king of Armenia to marry their son, Alexander Helios, to the Armenian princess. The king of Armenia refused, and thus Mark Anthony set off for Armenia with his troops and conquered them as an act of revenge. When he returned to Egypt, the couple had a large public parade. Mark paraded the prisoners of war to Cleopatra. It was written that at this event, Cleopatra was dressed in the guise of Isis. She is said to have declared that she was Queen of Kings and that Caesarion was King of Kings. She even proclaimed her infant son as King of their Armenia. It was at this event where they publicly announced their future plans. Cleopatra, also wanting to stamp her permanent mark, ordered new currency to be minted. Several coins showing the queen were created. These coins showed her in profile, wearing a Greek diadem and her hair in a Greek-styled bun. Some coins had Anthony on the reverse, and some even had their children depicted. Cleopatra even had a large granite stela placed at Karnak Temple, the holiest site of Egypt. The stela shows Cleopatra and Caesarion making offerings to the patron gods of Thebes, Montu, the god of war, and the almighty god of gods, Amu. It wasn't long before the news reached Octavian about the announcements of Cleopatra and Mark Anthony. Octavian publicly stated that Cleopatra had bewitched Mark Anthony using her magic of Isis, that Mark Anthony had illegally detained the king of Armenia, and that he had stolen books to stock the library of Alexandria, and that this marriage to Cleopatra was unlawful since he was married still to Octavian's sister. The final straw was when Octavian made a claim that Mark Anthony wanted to conquer Rome and move the capital to Alexandria. The Roman Senate finally declares outright war against Cleopatra, resulting in a devastating naval battle. One item can bring us closer to Cleopatra than any other. It demonstrates her deep knowledge for diplomacy. A papyrus from approximately 33 BC, Cleopatra signs a tax exemption for a man living in Alexandria. This man is a chief army commander and a financial backer of Mark Anthony. By signing this tax exemption, 
Cleopatra knew that it was a good move because this man was somebody she wanted to keep on sides. Cleopatra approves the tax exemption and signs it in her own handwriting, stating, Let it be done. In the late period, the priests had raised their power once again and increased their taxes. It was here at Kasir Karun that some of this drama played out. Going up the many flights of stairs, we enter an area once reserved only for priests and royals. And when you come onto the roof of this temple, it's one of the very few temples where the roof is still fully intact. When you walk out here, you can see the settlements around, the Roman baths that were built, the houses where the priests and the farmers from the area that fed this temple would have lived. And I can just imagine when there was the strike happening just before Cleopatra died, people coming here complaining to the temple, where's our grain? And the priest who would have been too scared to go downstairs because he might have been taken out, would have stood up here, spoken to the people. Your grain is on the way. We're waiting for the taxes. You haven't worshipped the gods justly, making all of these assumptions to the people why they were not receiving their food. It is amazing that Cleopatra is able to remain in power for 19 years, although in her time there are droughts in Egypt and hunger prevails between the people. She has to open the silos for the people to find enough corn to eat. Almost instantly, upon hearing that Rome has now officially declared war with Egypt, Cleopatra and Mark Anthony went to Greece to seek counsel and aid in 31 BC. Many foreign kings agreed to assist Cleopatra, yet some who were once allies turned their backs in fear of Octavian. Mark and his men urged Cleopatra to go back to Egypt. She insisted on staying for the war. Cleopatra stated that she would rather tackle Octavian's troops in Greece as a way to block him from arriving in Egypt. On September the 2nd, 31 BC, the naval forces of Egypt faced Rome in Greece at Actium. Cleopatra and Mark Anthony led 60 ships towards those of Octavian. However, the battle was unsuccessful for Cleopatra. During the battle, many Egyptian and the Allied ships were destroyed. Cleopatra and Mark Anthony fled the scene while the battle was still taking place. This caused many of the Allied ships to surrender. The battle had caused much embarrassment on the part of Mark Anthony. He reportedly did not speak to Cleopatra for the next three days on their fleeing voyage. They arrived back in Egypt, not at Alexandria, but at a bay just out of the region. Anthony boarded a ship and went to Cyrene in Greece, while Cleopatra returned to Alexandria. Cleopatra was now trying to make plans to save Egypt, but many allies that she had reached out to turned away from her and sided with Octavian after learning of the Battle of Actium. Cleopatra is suggested to have began plans to retire to a foreign land and install her son, Caesarion, as full pharaoh. She did in fact have a stela erected of her son, Caesarion, showing him dressed as a full Egyptian before he was even crowned. This was in about January 30 BC. The stela shows Caesarion making offerings to Atum, the creator god, the crocodile god Sobek, the fertility god Min, and of course, Isis. The cartouches are empty, showing that Caesarion had not yet been crowned as pharaoh, 
yet the text below mentions Cleopatra and her son, and this was placed at the center of religion in Egypt at Karnak Temple. Cleopatra made attempts to plead with Octavian. She wrote to him and asked that Mark Anthony be exiled from Rome to Egypt and that her children remain in control of Egypt in exchange of yearly payments to Rome. In her letter, she said that if her requests were not met, that she would burn herself and the promised treasures in her tomb. After months of negotiating that led nowhere, Octavian set out to invade Egypt. He attacked Mark Anthony and his troops in Cyrene, defeating them. Mark Anthony made a hastened journey back to Egypt. In 30 BC, in August, Octavian and his army attacked Alexandria. Mark Anthony defended the city, resulting in Octavian's men withdrawing for a few hours. It was then that Mark Anthony received news that Cleopatra was dead. Devastated and not seeing a way out of this mess without Cleopatra, he stabbed himself in the stomach to commit suicide. However, this news of Cleopatra being dead was not true. It was a ploy. According to the accounts of Plutarch, Mark Anthony's men were able to stabilize him and take him to Cleopatra. At her tomb, he was able to speak to her, stating that she can trust Proculius. Mark Anthony then died, aged 53. Others suggest he was already dead when taken to Cleopatra. The queen, who was about to set light to the tomb, was interrupted by Proculius, who demanded to take her to the palace to meet with Octavian. She pleaded to bury Mark Anthony. He allowed her to wrap him as a mummy and laid him to rest inside her own tomb. Cleopatra was presented before Octavian, who had seized her three young children. The Roman historian Livy states that Octavian had agreed not to kill Cleopatra but made no promise of not being taken to Rome. He quotes Cleopatra as shouting out, I will not be led in a Roman triumph. Cleopatra had seen her sister humiliated in the Roman parade, and she had no intention of becoming that. But it was Octavius' dream that he, he should take Cleopatra as a prisoner to show in front of all the people in Rome the lady that she captured the hearts of Caesar and Mark Antony. Finally, on the 10th of August, 30 BC, seeing no way out, no way to save Egypt, nor herself, Cleopatra kills herself at 39 years old. The death of Cleopatra is controversial. Many say she killed herself in her tomb. Many say she killed herself while imprisoned in the palace. What we do know is that she was accompanied by two ladies-in-waiting who eventually killed themselves as well. The myth goes that she had an Egyptian cobra bite her breast and that is how she died. This theory has many holes in it. If she was in a rush to go to her tomb to kill herself, how did they get the time to get a snake? If the snake was delivered in a fruit bowl or a jug, the snake would have been visible and the snake would have not had enough venom to kill Cleopatra and the two ladies in waiting. Her body has never been discovered, so we have to rely on ancient sources to formulate a theory of what happened to her. The earliest account is by Greek historian Strabo. He tells us two different accounts. He tells us either she died of snake venom or a poisonous ointment. Then we have 
Greek physician Galen. He tells us that she bit rum and then poured venom over it. And then we have Dio, who is writing a substantial length after she died. He tells us that she had two slight prick marks on her arms, thereby implicating a snake. But the most famous account by far is that by Plutarch. Now, I think the reason why his account is so famous because he says that his source is Cleopatra's physician Olympus. But it's difficult to know which part is by Olympus and where it becomes Plutarch's imagination. We don't actually have any writings by Olympus to go on, so we have to take his word for it. But what he tells us is that um, a peasant married the snake in a basket full of figs and the snake was concealed under some leaves and then Cleopatra took the snake, put it on her arm and let it bite her and this is what killed her and her handmaidens as well. It's very tricky with his explanation because the actual cobra in question is way too large to conceal in a basket of figs. And also the other problem with this theory is that snakes don't always like to release their venom. Most of their bites are dry bites, so there's only about 10% chance of having a venomous bite. His theory just begins to crumble when you look at it in a little bit more detail. It's also interesting that he doesn't discuss the marks or any sort of... He, he tells us that she looked flawless. Some Egyptologists say that Cleopatra killing herself with a snake allowing it to bite her was seen as a noble death. Well, maybe to the Greeks, being killed by a snake or committing suicide was a noble death. However, Cleopatra, who aligned herself with the beliefs of the ancient Egyptians, would have known that committing suicide or being bitten by a snake that you inflict upon yourself was a common sentence for convicted criminals. Surely a woman who was filled with pride of her ancient Egyptian belief system would not have taken the route to have herself bitten by a snake committing suicide. She would have known that this was not a noble Egyptian way to die. Other sources like Galen mention a mark on the upper arm. Cleopatra's physician offers us a clearer and more reliable verdict on her death. Upon finding and examining the queen, he notes it was snake venom. Cleopatra, being well versed in the study of medicines and poisons, would have known that pouring a small amount of poison into an open cut would be enough to kill herself. So there's a few theories of how she could have actually died. One of them is that she swallowed some poison, most likely hemlock and some wolfsbane. Now, the problem with this theory is that none of the sources actually say that she ingested, that she swallowed any poison. All of them refer to poison going straight into her bloodstream, so injecting the poison. And there would have been at least one source that would have said this, so like, it looks very unlikely. And also, drinking poison would have been excruciatingly painful. Hemlock can cause awful convulsions as well. So would she want to inflict that kind of pain on herself? The other thing we have to remember is that it, Plutarch tells us that Cleopatra experimented with poisons because she wanted to find the one that inflicts the least pain. She's accused of carrying out these experiments on condemned prisoners. I think she cut herself and probably poured snake venom onto the wound and this would have killed her with relatively quick speed and through respiratory failure. So this is probably the most plausible explanation because extracted snake venom stays lethal for quite a considerable length of time. When she hears the Roman will uh, offend her in front of her nation in Alexandria, she committed suicide by cobra 
brother than to be offended on, uh, in, uh, in front of her nation. So who can take this decision? Only a strong personality who can do this decision to commit suicide to keep her dignity protected. So uh, a lot of respect and love to Cleopatra. The tale of Cleopatra, including the political tactics, the her love life, and even the mysterious death by a, a Egyptian cobra bite, this all spread throughout the world, and it helped to inspire poems, uh, art, and plays like William Shakespeare and Egyptian Ahmed Shawi, and even several uh, Hollywood uh, movies. So actually, even before, long before the Tut al Khamun uh, discovery, Cleopatra, she was actually the uh, source of uh, Egyptomania and uh, of the world looking to Egypt. Very different to the pharaonic ancient Egyptian history, the history of the Ptolemies in Egypt is very well documented by the Greek and Roman historians of that time. In the Islamic world, El Masudi in the 10th century writes that Cleopatra was amongst scholars. Arab sources reveal that her knowledge of philosophy, law, history, culture, the arts, alchemy, medicine, and religion were vast. These sources also show Cleopatra to be an extraordinary and devout ruler. The author of several books in medicine and alchemy. When Octavian saw Cleopatra dead, although enraged, he did allow Cleopatra to be embalmed and buried in her tomb alongside Mark Anthony. This too is disputed. Do you think that Octavian would have really afforded her a royal burial? I, I doubt it because we know that, that, that Octavian or Augustus as he will later on be referred to cleared all of uh, Cleopatra's treasures and took them back with him to Rome. So uh, even if he did bury her, it would have not been a royal burial. He, he was not going to let her uh, get buried with uh, tons and tons of gold. We know it is recorded that he left Alexandria with all of her treasures and all of her money. I was involved in the search of the tomb of Cleopatra for about 12 years. I did uh, join Catherine Martinez and we worked together inside a temple called Tabo Osiris Magna. That temple is located west of Alexandria. And Catherine thought that Cleopatra and Mark Antony could be buried there. We started our excavation we discovered many statues of Ptolemy and also coins of Cleopatra and faces of Cleopatra. And the most important face that we found, it's a beautiful alabaster face, show Cleopatra as a very white woman. We also worked outside the temple of Tabo Osiris Magna and we discovered a big, large cemetery. I really do not believe that Cleopatra was actually buried uh, in this temple. But maybe she used this temple, because this temple in Tabo Osiris Magna was built for the goddess Isis. And maybe Cleopatra connected herself with Isis. Then maybe she could be visiting the temple. And this is why we have statues of many other Ptolemaic kings and also for Cleopatra. And yeah. even we have evidence that this temple was built by Ptolemais number uh, five. One of the most intriguing queens and celebrities figures. This is the reason why I've been searching for Cleopatra's tomb. I believe she deserved to be found. I came out with a theory that Queen Cleopatra could be buried in a location 45 kilometers west of Alexandria, Tabo Zeris Magna. I believe it could represent 
an important meaning for Queen Cleopatra since she portrayed herself as goddess Isis and Mark Anthony used to dress as the representation of Osiris. And I believe even though the location has never been even considered before, important objects has been discovered so far that link the temple to Queen Cleopatra. And I believe if there's any place that reunite all the conditions to be the final resting place of Queen Cleopatra, it will be Taposiris Magna. We have a palace for Cleopatra. And this palace is located under the water now. And we know from historical facts that Cleopatra built a tomb for herself next door to this palace. Then maybe Cleopatra was buried inside this tomb. When I did my famous uh, TV series, It's Chasing Mummies, I did go and I began to take some pillars from uh, the palace of Cleopatra. Then we know that Cleopatra built a palace there. Cleopatra did manage to send her son Caesarion away down south to Nubia en route to Ethiopia. While traveling, his mother died. Then Caesarion legally became Pharaoh, but only for around 18 days before he was captured by Octavian's men and executed on the Romans' orders. Cleopatra's three remaining children were eventually taken to Rome. They were paraded as prisoners. Her two sons would disappear, and her daughter was married off to an ally of Rome in Mauritania. She was queen of that land for quite some time, and requested many of her mother's scribes and scholars be sent to her. She had a son named Ptolemy, who went on to rule Mauritania for a short time before being executed by Caligula in 40 AD and thus completely ending the Ptolemaic bloodline. Cleopatra's legacy lives on today, but let's try and look past the myth and focus on who she really was. A woman, a sister, a mother, a fighter, a queen, a pharaoh.
and finding the muffy muffy <laughs> that's horrible um there there have been muffs found but anyway um finding finding the mummy of nefertiti you know what could it potentially teach us Thank you.